Get it for me. Okay. The committee will come to order. The chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes, I'm sorry, three minutes for an opening statement. Today we have five million households who are part of the National Flood Insurance Program. Clearly these people need some level of security, continuity, predictability for their homes. This is their homes. They also deserve some fairness with respect to rates in the face of mapping issues, numerous cross subsidies. Because unfortunately today, many moderate and low income individuals actually subsidize others. But there's another group that deserves fairness as well, and that is the 110 million households who are not part of the National Flood Insurance Program who subsidize the program. 96% of Americans are currently subsidizing 4%. We know this is a program that is $25 billion underwater and runs an actuarial annual deficit of $1.4 billion. It is unsustainable. The 96% of Americans, they have their dreams, they have their hopes, they have their struggles in to continue to bail out and subsidize a program that unfortunately is unsustainable. Before me and to my left and right is the national debt clock. It continues to spin out of control. I know some view this as some kind of partisan ploy. It is not. Perhaps others have grown accustomed to it. Perhaps they are even anesthetized by it, but instead, it is something that should frighten us, and it is something that should anger us. It is not something we can tax our way out of. As Lady Thatcher once said, sooner or later you run out of rich people. I, for one, cannot look my children in the eyes and be complicit or complacent in the national debt that threatens their future. It is not fair. We must act. It is both an economic and moral imperative. Now is the time, as NFIP is up for reauthorization. There are a number of items that we must discuss and reform. One is mitigation. Mitigation can often be cost effective. It is a classic case where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I would ask that all fiscal conservatives be open to such. Premiums. 31 cents of every premium dollar goes to marketing and servicing of policies. This deserves attention, and only 46 cents are available to pay claims. This also deserves attention. Risk transfer requirements are necessary, uh, as are catastrophe bonds. We have challenges of multiple lost properties where roughly 2% of all properties account for almost 25% of claims, and it begs the question, how many times should taxpayers be called upon to rebuild the same property? But most importantly, gradually over time, we must transition all to actuarial sound rates, otherwise we are helping put more people in harm's way. Equally important to both taxpayers and ratepayers is opening up the program to private market competition. Notwithstanding congressional intent, the federal government has an effective monopoly. We lose out on competition, we lose out on innovation, which is a consumer's best friend. I want to thank many members who have worked on this bill on a bipartisan basis. I want to especially thank Chairman Duffy for his leadership, Chairman Luca Meyer before him, uh, the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Velasquez, on the other side of the aisle. This is a problem that is not going away, and there is a better, smarter way to handle <coughs> flood insurance. I now recognize the ranking member for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to all of our witnesses. We're here to discuss draft legislation to reauthorize the National Flood Insurance Program. This hearing is critically important. The NFIP is set to expire in a matter of months, and we simply cannot allow the program to lapse. For years prior to the passage of Biggered Waters, Congress had been extending the NFIP for just months at a time. Twice this led to shutdowns, including one that stalled more than 40,000 home sales in one month alone. 
These short-term extensions place communities at risk and undermine our housing market. That is why, Mr. Chairman, we cannot let politics get in the way of the work of legislating to keep flood insurance available and affordable. While there are certainly some provisions in the draft package of legislation before us today that seem to be reflective of the ideas that I and many of the Democrats and Republicans that I have worked with on this program share, it absolutely falls short in many respects. Our requests are simple. Provide a long-term reauthorization to ensure stability and confidence in the market. Address the debt and the billions of dollars it costs tax uh, policyholders already struggling with unaffordable premiums. Provide robust affordability assistance to those who may literally lose their homes if we do not act. Put guardrails in place to ensure that the development of a private market does not threaten the affordability and availability of coverage. Invest heavily in mapping and mitigation, which we know saves more money than it costs. And put policyholders first by bringing transparency, accountability, and oversight to the various entities that participate in the program. Mr. Chairman, I truly believe that this reauthorization can be bipartisan, but I'm concerned that if you do not heed my call to work together on the details of this package, it will cause irreparable harm to the millions of Americans who rely on the NFIP to protect their homes and businesses. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy, chairman of our Housing and Insurance Subcommittee, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to uh, thank you for holding this uh, important hearing and, and thank our witnesses for being here today. I'm looking forward uh, to your testimony and uh, also hearing where um, everyone stands uh, in this committee. And to the ranking member, I appreciate her comments, uh, but I, I think a lot of her concerns are addressed in this bill, and I look forward to continuing to work with her and other Democrats um, on an important issue that's nonpartisan. This is an issue that affects a lot of families in a lot of places across our country, uh, some of them in wealthy areas, but many people that come from uh, very impoverished uh, areas that rely on flood insurance uh, to make sure they can keep their homes. Uh, but uh, this is the third uh, hearing we're having on this issue. Uh, we've had two on the housing and uh, insurance subcommittee. One uh, was a hearing with FEMA, and the other was uh, a hearing with stakeholders uh, in uh, communities that rely on flood insurance. As the chairman mentioned, uh, I think there are a few key uh, parts of this discussion draft. One uh, is on mapping. We hear continuously complaints about the mapping process and how people are mapped and how unfair it is. Uh, chairman Luchtemeyer uh, did a lot of work on this and I think uh, we're striking the right balance on reforms uh, to make sure mapping is done correctly. Another area of concern is Sandy. Um, in the Sandy claims process. And uh, those in uh, the Northeast have been very uh, aggressive and focused on making sure there's lessons that were learned from Sandy. And we take those lessons learned into reforms into this package. And uh, I think it's been a unique coalition of Republicans and Democrats working together to make sure that we had those reforms contained in this bill. Um, we have a, a, a great component for mitigation, uh, helping families mitigate their homes um, with uh, about a billion dollars over a five-year period of time um, of this uh, bill. Uh, one of the key components uh, is uh, Mr. Ross's provision, which is our private uh, markets. Uh, one, to lower the exposure of the American taxpayer, but two, a private market will offer better rates to homeowners who can't get um, uh, a market-based uh, rate from uh, the NFIP. Uh, I have a lot more to say, but my time has expired and I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now yields two minutes to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, ranking member of the Housing and Insurance Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and ranking member uh, Waters. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today uh, to our full committee. Uh, I've been uh, able to work uh, over the past uh, weeks uh, with uh, Chairman Duffy, uh, who has released uh, six draft proposals designed to reauthorize uh, the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, and I think there are a number of things in there that uh, many of us will happily embrace. Uh, there are some things that I think re require, that, do in, that will in, uh, require uh, some significant debate. Uh, it, it is not in our best interest, for, for example, 
uh, to continue uh, to pile debt on debt uh, with the $20.4 uh, billion uh, we already owe as a result of this program. And so I think there should be a way for us uh, to uh, get that debt out of the way, uh, have it forgiven, and start over in a new program. And for us to do that, it would be also helpful if we could have the reauthorization uh, uh, extended for uh, a 10 year period. Uh, if we do that, uh, we will allow for uh, the real estate industry and uh, frankly, uh, FEMA uh, to have some time of stability. Uh, and I think if we are really uh, interested in getting the private sector to become more involved, uh, the opportunity for the expansion also, I think, uh, is a magnet uh, for uh, greater uh, participation as we move into the, uh, the, 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 the next few years uh, with, the, um, with the private sector. Uh, I've had a number of, of, of private conversations with Mr. Duffy. I've had meetings and roundtables with uh, those in the uh, private sector. I think everybody agrees that we need to do this. I look forward to the uh, meeting today and hopefully uh, some increased flexibility on some of the other issues that I've mentioned. Time of the gentleman has expired. Before we recognize our witnesses, the chair would like to announce without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record today. We now welcome the testimony of our panel, who I will introduce uh, as a group. First, Mr. Steve Ellis, Vice President, Taxpayers for Common Sense. Mr. Ellis joined Taxpayers for Common Sense in 1999. Prior to that, he served as an officer in the United States Coast Guard for six years. Ms. Caitlin Burney, Vice President, Policy and Communication, Greater New Orleans, Inc. Welcome. Greater New Orleans, Inc. is a regional economic development alliance serving the 10 parish region of southeast Louisiana. Ms. Burney is responsible for directing the organization's policy work at the federal and state level and serves as the primary liaison with congressional, state, and local elected officials. Mr. Josh Sachs is the Legislative Director of the National Wildlife Federation. He coordinates uh, outreach on clean water and wetlands issues, energy policy, federal appropriations for wildlife conservation, protection of public lands in Alaska and the Rocky Mountain West. Ms. Rebecca Kagan Sternhill, Deputy Director and General Counsel, New York City Federal Affairs Office. Ms. Sternhill was most recently a Deputy Assistant Administrator at the U.S. Small Business Administration. Finally, Mr. R.J. Lehman, Senior Fellow, Editor-in-Chief and Co-Founder of R Street Institute. He's the author of 2012-2015 editions of R Street's Insurance Regulation Report Card and numerous other R Street policy papers. Before joining R Street, he served as Deputy Director of the Heartlands Institute's Center on Finance, Insurance, and Real Estate. Welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for agreeing to testify. I know some of you have testified before us before, so you know the drill. Those who do not, you will be yielded five minutes for an opening statement. Green means go. Yellow means you're running out of time. You have one minute to wrap it up. Red means please stop. It is time to go on to the next witness. When we call upon you, if you will, turn on your microphone and bring it very close to your mouth so we can all hear your testimony. Uh, at this time, Mr. Ellis, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Henserling, Ranking Member Waters, members of the committee. I am Steve Ellis, Vice President of Taxpayers for Common Sense, a national nonpartisan budget watchdog. Thank you for inviting me to testify on the upcoming reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. Taxpayers for Common Sense is allied with Smarter Safer, a coalition in favor of promoting public safety through fiscally sound, environmentally responsible approaches to natural catastrophe policy. The groups range from free market and taxpayer groups to consumer and housing advocates to environmental and insurance industry interests. Um, Mr. Sachs and Mr. Lehman's organizations, the National Wildlife Federation and R Street Institute are also members of Smarter Safer. This brings me to the first of two issues I was asked to address. Whether the NFIP represents an ideal model for the effective protection of residential and commercial property owners from the damages related to flooding. The quick and obvious answer is no. The NFIP is far from ideal. The program was created in 1968 to reduce ad hoc disaster payments and to deal with the perceived lack of available and affordable flood insurance. 
Nearly half a century on, it is nearly $25 billion in debt to taxpayers, and there have been enormous technological innovations that enable insurers to accurately price risk and provide products and coverages unavailable through NFIP. Today, the industry is clamoring to right flood and remove some of the risk from taxpayers like they do elsewhere in the world. Though the NFIP provides critical insurance coverage to those at risk, the program must be significantly formed to ensure that it is financially sustainable, provide sufficient incentives for reducing future flood damages and vulnerabilities, better protect taxpayers who have repeatedly backstopped the program, and better protect the environment and promote nature-based mitigation solutions for a long-term benefit for homeowners and taxpayers. We applaud the committee for putting legislative pen to paper and releasing their proposals. While we'd like to see some changes and improvements, the legislative drafts provide a great start to the process. TCS believes that the rates in the program must over time be linked to risk while understanding that there, must, there may be some in the program who will need assistance in order to pay higher rates or reduce their risk. Currently, subsidies are, hidden, are effectively hidden from the homeowner, which eliminates any price signal of risk or incentive to mitigate to reduce the risk, thereby the premium. To that end, we are pleased that the committee uh, proposal includes provisions to make premium methodology more clear to the policyholder, as well as an explanation of their full flood risk and increased public access to historic loss and flood claims information. We are opposed to the artificial rate cap in the legislative proposal. A better approach is to target any premium assistance to those who need it and to encourage and target mitigation measures that could serve to reduce rates by reducing risk. We are pleased to see that H.R. 1422, the Flood Insurance Market Parity and Modernization Act, was incorporated in the legislative proposal. H.R. 1422 would ensure that the private sector flood insurance counts for the purposes of the mandatory purchase requirements. The private sector is now writing first dollar flood insurance even in the highest risk areas. There are 20 companies writing private flood, and private flood insurance in Florida, home to nearly 40 percent of the NFIP policies. A majority of these are writing flood coverage in the highest risk areas. TCS believes that the mapping fee on NFIP and private policies in the legislative proposal should be transparent to the policyholders as to its provenance and use. On mapping, we support the legislative proposal for greater public involvement, use of risk assessment tools in determining rates, and directing FEMA to work with the Technical Mapping Advisory Council to improve the mapping process. Going further, FEMA should be required to move to a system of more granular property-level mapping, as has been done by states like North Carolina. TCS is pleased to see the committee included uh, provisions to require an annual independent actuarial review of, NF of the NFIP, as well as provisions to increase the use of risk transfer tools. The greater information requirements, as well as the gradual remo removal of subsidies and shift toward risk-based rates for multiple lost properties, makes sense. I recognize the value of targeting mitigation assistance to these properties, but it should be means-tested. If a homeowner can afford to mitigate, they should not be subsidized to do so. TCS also supports provisions that re prospectively restrict access to NFIP for properties with extreme loss profiles and to not make available federal flood insurance to high-risk properties that are added to the special flood hazard area, as well as high-value properties when private coverage is available and relatively affordable. Again, TCS congratulates the committee on providing a responsible, thoughtful, legislative start to NFIP reauthorization. While I noted some differences, we are ready to work with the committee to make reforms to the NFIP to ensure the program is sustainable in the long term. The second issue I was asked to address is the cause of NFIP's $1.4 billion annual premium shortfall and what reforms are necessary to ensure the program collects sufficient revenue to pay claims. My testimony ought to address that topic throughout. With better property level mapping, a focus on mitigation and risk reduction, a move to risk-based rates with targeted subsidies, and private sector competition, we believe NFIP will be strengthened and more people will be able to purchase needed flood and coverage. Thank you for inviting me to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Ms. Bernie, you're now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Henserling, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee. I am honored to speak to you today about the package of bills proposed to reauthorize the National Flood Insurance Program. My name is Caitlin Bernie, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Communications of Greater New Orleans, Inc., the Economic Development Organization for Southeast Louisiana. Since April 2013, GNO, Inc. has led the Coalition for Sustainable Flood Insurance, a national alliance of approximately 250 organizations across 35 states, formed during Bigger Waters implementation. Our coalition was a driving force behind the passage of the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act, compromise legislation that was co-sponsored by more than 235 members of this body, passed with 306 votes, representing the overwhelming support of both caucuses and passed the Senate with the support of 72 senators. Since the passage of the 2014 law, 
our coalition has focused on advocating for a stronger policy framework for the NFIP. There are four primary policy areas that will provide for this stronger framework. Mitigation, mapping, affordability, and program participation. Let me start by recognizing that there is no simple answer to the complex challenge of maintaining premium affordability, keeping the NFIP on sound financial footing, ensuring taxpayer protections, and accurately communicating risk. And this is not just about our coastal cities. Floods, and therefore flood insurance, matters for the entire country. Flooding is the most common natural disaster in the United States, affecting communities in each of the 50 states and territories. That that said, our coalition is concerned that the committee's approach on several pro provisions may result in some of the same unintended consequences, primarily around affordability and sustainability, that arose during the implementation of the Bigger Waters Act. Our coalition is concerned that increasing the floor of rate increases from 5% to 8% will have a detrimental effect on premium affordability. While the bill does propose to lower the overall premium cap from 18% to 15%, Increasing the floor will negatively impact many more policyholders than lowering the ceiling will help, especially when considering that premiums are increasing an average of 6.3% this year. The rate structure and affordability provisions included in the 2014 law will eventually result in higher flood insurance premiums for all rate classifications already, and increasing rates will likely result in affordability challenges during the midst of this next reauthorization period. We urge Congress not to increase rates or surcharges in this reauthorization. Another critical tool to preserving affordability is to maintain grandfathering so that those property owners who did everything as they were told by building to code will not be faced with rate shocks when their communities adopt new maps. Accurately communicating and assessing risk is a top priority for our coalition. We support the committee's proposals to improve mapping, including using better technology and map development and streamlining the mapping and appeals process. However, the current map process often results in communities having to fight inaccurate maps that do not take into account locally built flood protection features, which results in artificially inflated risk. We must question whether we can truly determine actuarial rates if they are based on flawed mapping. Ultimately, mitigation is the real answer to preventing flood losses and reducing taxpayer exposure to flooding. We are concerned that the committee's approach does not provide communities with the tools needed to effectively implement mitigation plans and will not accomplish reducing flood losses or taxpayer exposure. Congress should instead consider redirecting the surcharges in the 2014 law to better finance the pre-disaster mitigation and the flood mitigation assistance programs. This proposal would yield approximately 400 million annually for flood mitigation activities. However, our coalition does support several provisions in this package, including improving map development, strengthening the CRS program, and modernizing ICC coverage. Um, but given the past record of broad bipartisan support for affordable, sustainable flood insurance, we urge Congress to pass a multi-year reauthorization by September 30th that ensures affordability, improves mapping, increases support for mitigation activities, and increases flood insurance coverage across America. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and for your service. I look forward to taking your questions. Mr. Sachs, uh, you are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Henserling, Ranking Member Waters, members of the committee. I'm Joshua Sachs, and I serve as the Legislative Director for the National Wildlife Federation, the nation's largest member-based conservation group, representing six million members and supporters and affiliate organizations in 51 states and territories. NWF is also a member of Smarter Safer, as was mentioned before. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding the committee's proposal to reform and reauthorize the National Flood Insurance Program. But first, allow me to say a few words about NWF's interest in flood insurance. Floodplains, the flood-prone bottomlands that cradle rivers, streams, and oceans are where the land and the waters meet. Naturally functioning floodplains provide vital habitat for countless wildlife species as well as a number of other ecological benefits. As such, healthy floodplains are key to NWF's mission of protecting and preserving America's wildlife. But for today's purposes, and more broadly speaking, healthy natural floodplains provide the best flood protection money can buy. Yet while the NFIP was created with the intention of slowing or preventing new flood-prone coastal and riverine development, the current floodplain management system in the U.S. is not working. Instead of reducing floodplain development, flood-prone coastal population growth and development in the U.S. has skyrocketed since the program's creation. The coastal area that covers 17% of the nation's land area is now home to half of its population. 
NFIP has contributed to this problem by encouraging development in flood prone areas by charging subsidized rates and masking flood risk. In addition, the subsidized rates have failed to send market signals to encourage mitigation. To address this, NWF encourages the NFIP charge risk-based rates and encourage mitigation. For these reasons, NWF supports proposed efforts by the committee to ensure rates continue to move towards risk-based risk -based, while providing some measures to help create flood in, to keep flood insurance affordable. NWF is comfortable with the limitation on rate increases included in the committee's draft bills. We believe that this allows FEMA the flexibility to continue to move towards risk-based market signals while limiting the potential impact on short-term increases. NWF also applauds the committee for allowing states the ability to create flood insurance affordability programs, the first time Congress has addressed affordability outside of the rate structure. We recommend the inclusion of additional provisions that would provide means-tested assistance to low-income homeowners with a preference towards mitigation assistance rather than premium support. While NWF supports the committee's proposals to keep flood insurance premiums affordable, we'll believe the best way to keep rates low and to protect people and property is through proactive mitigation. In other words, we need to reduce people's rates by reducing their risk, not by subsidizing risk. A considerable amount of data shows that this would be the most cost-effective way. Several analyses have shown a $2 to $6 return on every investment or on every dollar spent on flood mitigation. But not all mitigations created equal. Community-wide, nature-based mitigation should be used whenever possible. These are practices that protect, restore, or in some cases even create natural features that reduce erosion and flooding. NWF urges the committee to consider any and all ways to drive immediate investment in this kind of mitigation. We applaud the increase to ICC compliance coverage to help cover the cost of mitigation measures that will reduce flood risk, but loans are not enough to upgrade America's resilience to flooding. America needs immediate investment in coastal and river and resilience, and we encourage the committee to consider any and all ways to increase pre-disaster mitigation spending, including empowering FEMA to analyze whether it is most cost effective to provide premium support or upfront mitigation dollars, we also encourage the committee to consider spending a portion of the NFIP reserve fund dollars on upfront pre-disaster mitigation. NWF applauds the risk reduction planning provisions of the proposal, a key step in protecting communities. We believe that it is essential to target flood-prone hotspots, to create detailed plans to reduce flood risk, and to implement them. We support the Royce Blumenauer proposal to create mitigation plans for communities with multiple severe repetitive lost properties and request the committee find a way to ensure that the plans include community-wide nature-based mitigation. We also believe that the proposal to create a pilot program for buyouts of severe repetitive lost properties for low-income homeowners would ultimately provide the best type of mitigation, that which avoids loss of life and property by restoring lowlands to healthy, naturally functioning floodplains. Americans cannot wait until the next storm for long-term planning to take hold, and we encourage the committee to find ways to invest immediately in community-wide mitigation. Finally, NWF believes that the discussion draft before us today represents true progress towards reforming the NFIP. We thank the committee. Raise children and seek refuge. The property is also most homeowners' largest tangible asset and nest egg. Too often as this discussion proceeds, we can lose sight of this point. It's easy to glibly say people need to move or too bad. It is quite another to talk face to face with a constituent who must leave the home that has been in their family for generations or to let them know that their property has little to no value because of insurance costs and policy made many miles away in Washington, D.C. The remainder of my testimony will focus on the chief concerns of our residents and the legislation being discussed today. The issue of greatest concern is affordability. A few months ago, the city was pleased to share with this committee and other stakeholders a RAND com report commissioned to look at what affordability meant and model out options to remedy the issue. Three major findings I wish to highlight here. Grandfathering of properties is one of the most effective affordability tools available. Targeted means-tested vouchers or credits are the most cost-effective tools available. And mitigation is cost-effective with greater premium reductions and grants in support of it. Given this, we are concerned about the proposal in the Integrity Bill that ostensibly eliminates grandfathering after 2021. The affordability issue also looms large in the proposal in the Integrity Bill that would in many ways disallow any new coastal or riverine development and at the same time foreclose the NFIP as an option to many residents. Section 8 would not allow NFIP coverage for new construction in the SFHA. 
In order to be eligible for NFIP plus the mandated 10% surcharge, the state would need to certify that insufficient private coverage is available. This must be done year over year, adding bureaucracy and complication to the NFIP. Most troubling to residents is the resultant uncertainty as to whether their coverage will be dropped by the NFIP from one year to the next. What if no coverage is available that they can afford? More importantly, what happens with maintaining continuous coverage? Or if no private insurer will insure a given property? The situation becomes nightmarish for taxpayers and has the potential to leave many in a donut hole of no coverage. I would strongly urge the committee to revisit, if not eliminate this provision, and instead find a way to work with it's work and I'm in the mitigation bill. Hundreds of communities would face the threat of being kicked out of the NFIP because of a small number of properties with repeat claims. According to an analysis of FEMA data, 33 of the members of this committee, spread equally across party lines, would have at least one community in their district potentially kicked out of the NFIP or sanctioned under this provision. These numbers grow far worse with the proposed change to the definition of multiple loss property and severe repetitive loss in the integrity bill that would qualify even more communities for sanctions. Another area of concern is the elimination of the non-compete clause for write-your-own companies. Past witnesses representing the insurance industry in congressional hearings have admitted to cherry-picking the policies, which will leave the NFIP with only the riskiest properties, thus undermining its solvency. Rather than a dualistic approach, sharing all or sharing nothing, the city would like to offer a third way. Eliminating the non-compete for a subset of properties, the A through D properties, for example, they can be a proving ground to validate or dispel fears about cherry-picking FEMA's book. The committee could set a time frame for this and a review, ensuring the review is conducted by a non-stakeholder third, non third party, invest the administrator with the authority to reinstall or remove more non-competes. This needn't be an all-or-nothing proposition. Lastly, after the experience with the Sandy claims process and fraud, we wholeheartedly endorse the revisions to the claims process. We would also offer that a provision be included such that none of the rights to appeal, litigate, or review documents can be waived in court. I thank the committee again for their time and attention today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Levine, you're now recognized for five minutes for your statement. Chairman Hensterling, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee, my name is R.J. Lehman. I am Senior Fellow, Editor-in-Chief, and Co-Founder of the R Street Institute. R Street is a think tank based here in DC that seeks to promote free markets and limited effective government. Our insurance project highlights the crucial role that competitive private insurance markets play in helping society evaluate, mitigate, and manage risk. Unfortunately, despite reforms passed by this committee and ultimately signed by President Obama in 2012, NFIP premiums still do not reflect the full risk of loss. The program is not sustainable in its current form, as evidenced by its $25 billion debt, to prepare for shifting risks, to ensure that markets function properly, and to protect taxpayers from the exploding cost of disaster assistance, we believe it is essential that we begin to transition to a private risk-based insurance market for floods. Shifting flood insurance to the private sector will mean bringing powerful catastrophe models to bear to more accurately segment and price property level risks. It will mean having companies compete to fashion products that are more attractive to policyholders and that better meet their needs. Progress has already been made in the area of reinsurance. The NFIP historically relied on the Treasury whenever its losses exceeded its resources. But earlier this year, FEMA executed its first private reinsurance transaction, and we are pleased to see that the legislation would incorporate Representative Lukemeyer's proposal to require FEMA to use reinsurance to lower taxpayers' direct exposure to catastrophic loss. The legislation also makes changes to better capitalize the NFIP's reserve fund, which can be used to buy reinsurance. We support those changes, but we think reserve fund charges should be based on the risks posed by each individual property. The current assessments, which are based on a flat percentage of total premium, actually serve to magnify inequities between properties that pay subsidized rates and those that pay full risk rates. Uh, when it comes to primary flood insurance, uh, the private market currently is only about 12% of the size of the NFIP, but it is growing, and this legislation would address several concerns that have so far hindered its growth. Uh, it would remove the restriction that prohibited write-your-own insurers from selling standalone coverage outside of the NFIP. Uh, we are pleased also that it incorporates the Ross Castor bill to clarify that private coverage can be used to meet the mandatory purchase requirements. Uh, one area where we think it does fall a little short is in granting NFIP claims data access. Uh, zip code and census block level data isn't sufficient for insurance underwriting. Uh, property level data is essential. Uh, we understand that there are privacy concerns, but think that those can be uh, resolved through non-disclosure agreements. 
there has been the concern raised that a more active private market would destabilize the NFIP by allowing insurers to cherry pick low risk policies uh, until it was left a high risk pool. But the program already serves as a high risk pool. Only a, a relatively small number of homeowners buy flood insurance. Uh, compare that with the United Kingdom where flood insurance is sold privately, 95% of homeowners have flood insurance coverage. Uh, the vast majority of existing NFIP policyholders reside in one 100 year flood plains. That is a high risk cohort. Uh, there are by and large no cherries to pick. Reducing the size of the program reduces its overall, all, overall exposure and the potential burden it can place on taxpayers. Uh, the single biggest impediment to a larger private market com remains the fact that the program does not completely charge risk-based rates, both subsidized policies and, and grandfathered policies. Uh, we support moving to risk-based rates for all NFIP policies over time uh, with an understanding that lower income policyholders may need assistance. Uh, such assistance should be targeted, limited, means tested, and executed outside of the rate structure of the NFIP. And we support the draft legislation's uh, proposal to authorize states to begin crafting affordability programs. We oppose the legislation's proposal to de decrease the cap on annual rate increases, and we strongly oppose the $10,000 hard cap. Uh, while we understand that this will affect very few properties, the concern is once it is introduced as a statutory mechanism, it could be lowered by a future Congress or even potentially by an executive order. Uh, so, and, and in addition, any premium relief we believe has to be conditioned on some form of disaster mitigation. So in closing, I'd like to reiterate our support for the broad co contours of the proposed legislation. Uh, making the transition to private flood insurance, or at least more private flood insurance, is complicated, but not nearly as complicated as continually rebuilding flood flood prone communities, and I'd be glad to answer any questions the members might have. Thank you, the chair. Chair now recognizes himself for five minutes to, um, for questioning. Um, so Mr. Ellis, um, it appears we've had testimony before that bringing in private market competition, which apparently some oppose, can have the effect of actually lowering rates. Uh, I believe it was last year we heard from the Pennsylvania Insurance uh, Commissioner, Ms. Miller, who cited several different cases uh, where one Pennsylvanian was charged $7,500 annual premium under NFIP, but found private coverage for $1,415. Another homeowner was quoted $6,000 annual premium by NFIP, but found a surplus line for only $900. She went on to cite several other examples, yet we have a very small private market. So why do we have such a small private market? And I think also in previous testimony, uh, you addressed the situation in Florida. Could you elaborate on uh, capacity and the ability of the private market to help drive rates down? Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, I mean, the simple fact is, is the only reason why someone would leave the NFIP to go to a private policy is if they got a better rate or they got a better product or both. And so um, we're just giving consumers choice, and certainly that would be a way to, uh, to drive down rates. Also, you know, they could bundle that, that coverage. There's a uh, company in Wisconsin that's doing that that makes it part of the overall homeowner's uh, insurance. I mean, certainly that was what Mr. Lehman was referring to in the UK. Uh, and then in Florida, what we saw with their citizens uh, program was that actually when they did a takeout of, uh, of insurance policies from their um, wind pool there, that actually the, um, the insurance companies took out uh, policies from all across the different risk spectrum. It wasn't simply just uh, lower risk properties. Well, if I could interrupt, another witness mentioned uh, the threat of cherry picking. So you're saying that the empirical evidence in Florida is otherwise. Correct. It was a study done by the Reassurance Association of America that showed that, no, they want to, because one is, is that's where you're going to be able to make more money, quite frankly, is the higher risk, and that's what insurance companies are in the business of doing. But then also it's that, that these are, they need to diversify their portfolio, and there's a lot of different reasons why insurance company would want to necessarily have higher risk and then could lay off that risk in other parts of the world through reinsurance. So it's a, it's a simplistic view to just think about it cherry picking. It's not really the way the business would approach it. Mr. Sachs, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I thought I heard you say something that uh, we need affordability through mitigation um, instead of subsidy. Is that the essence of what you stated? Yes, sir. 
So can you expound a little bit on your organization's preferred method of mitigation uh, and why that is preferable to subsidy? We believe that whenever a community can take steps to, to mitigate on the community-wide level, whether it's through natural features, which is best, or through levees or seawalls or other things like that, you are going to do the most to keep people's rates low. And we prefer that because at times it will provide the actions we like as opposed to continuing to provide subsidies. It's and and if this is why you endorse, yeah. did I understand you to endorse the Royce Blumenauer bill as part of your testimony, Diane? That's correct. Okay. And so this would be the essence of, of what you're trying to achieve? The Royce Blumenauer bill will push communities to take a long-term view of planning how to mitigate flood risk, and we support that notion. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bernie, Ms. Sternhill, if I heard your testimony correctly, you do not advocate premium increases for current NFIP holders. Is that correct? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We would advocate that the uh, c committee leave the current rate no, structure. No, I, I understand. So you'd like the current rate structure left as is. We have correspondence from CBO saying the program is running almost a billion and a half actual actuarial shortfall a year. So it's bringing in, um, it, it, it has an actuarial uh, need for five billion, it's bringing in 3.6. We have similar information from GAO and FEMA. So are you advocating, Ms. Bernie, as I understand it, this should be continued, a continued subsidy, uh, that it's the taxpayer who should make up this shortfall, is that correct? Well, no, sir, I, th I think we would argue that, as I mentioned in my verbal testimony, flooding does affect every state across the nation, and so this is a program that does benefit citizens. Okay, but who's supposed to make up the shortfall? If it's not rate payers, then it's taxpayers. Who, who, who else is there? Am I missing well, somebody? If you, if you, we've got some premium information from 2004 to 2016 that shows the NFIP with the exception of Hurricane Katrina and, and Sandy uh, and the 2016 losses, that the program um, ultimately um, does break even with the exception of a few catastrophic well, loss years. I've got to tell you, it's not what CBO has said, it's not what GAO has said, it's not what FEMA has said, and if I have the data correct, three of the six most costliest flood events have happened in the last six years. Uh, Mr. Sachs, does your organization see flooding events becoming less severe or more severe with the passage of time? Uh, Mr. Chairman, their e flood events are happening more often and they are more severe. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm out of time. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I really wish I had time to deal with two of the issues uh, that have been identified uh, by our witnesses. The private insurers, for example, I recall they left the market uh, following Katrina, and I guess every uh, disaster, but I remember Katrina very vividly because I was in Mississippi and New Orleans, uh, and the private market uh, abandoned uh, the, uh, uh, those communities, so uh, I don't have time to get into it. Uh, but on this mitigation, I believe in mitigation too. However, there's not a dollar in, this, in, in the chairman's bill for mitigation. So where's it going to come from? Uh, let me go on with some of the other things I want to deal with. I hope some of the other members will take up these issues of private uh, insurers and mitigation. The Republican bill attempts to respond to affordability challenges in the NFIP, but I'm concerned that on the whole, the proposals do not meaningfully address affordability, and in some cases may actually make matters worse. On the whole, are you concerned that policyholders may actually be worse off with the increased costs called for in this bill? What should we do instead to keep premiums affordable? And this question is for uh, Ms. Sternhill. Yes, I mean, we are concerned about affordability and certainly raising the floor um, plus the 1% uh, reserve fund, which effectively is a 50% increase. Um, so it would go up nine, rates would have to go up 9% annually, basically, where they're currently escalating year over year at about 6%. Um, does nothing to help the affordability situation. And in addition, you know, we have long advocated, especially with the RAND report, to have an affordability program that utilizes means-tested vouchers or credits. Uh, the program proposed here in the legislation actually imposes additional surcharges to pay for that. So you're sort of taking with one hand and giving with another. Uh, so 
that, while well intentioned, I mean, you know, we would gladly work with the committee to develop something else, isn't really going to get us as far as we need to towards the affordability. Well, uh, you alluded to it. Um, adding all of the various premium increases, surcharges increases, reserve fund assessment increases, and calls for increased cross subsidization. Um, you're, you're saying that uh, it seems that the policyholder is going to be paying much more in flood insurance under this bill. Can you talk a little bit about what that will mean? You know, I was one of the authors of uh, the Bigot Waters insurance program, which had all of the unintended consequences that I worked very hard uh, to undo uh, because we saw the premiums rise substantially. And some folks had premiums that matched their mortgage and they wouldn't be able to afford, uh, you know, that, those kinds of uh, premium costs. Could you share with us the other kinds of uh, problems that these uh, increases would cause the average homeowner? Well, certainly one of the ones we're already starting to see is distortion in real estate markets, where people maybe want to get out of the floodplain and want to move, uh, but nobody wants to buy that home because of the property value and because of the insurance costs affiliated with that property. So it, that affects not only that individual homeowner, but also you start to have like community-wide level effects uh, where I think it's down in Virginia you're seeing this, where there's recurring floods and people would like to get out, but there's not an effective mechanism for them to do it or one where they could sort of financially afford to even leave and start over somewhere else. Uh, I would like to just ask, uh, I had not planned on asking this question or talking about it, but I believe that um, we absolutely should forgive all of this debt. Uh, and of course the chairman, uh, adamantly disagrees with that. Anybody agree with me on, have you taken a look at the debt and um, the interest that we're paying on this debt? Do you have any thoughts about it? Uh, Congressman Waters, I mean, we're opposed to uh, forgiving the debt at this time. We want to see more significant reforms in the program and think that's um, an important uh, uh, means to concentrate the mind on those reforms. If sometime in the future, I think that it would be, be willing, reasonable. Before my time is up, give me one significant reform that would reduce these premiums. Well, I think it is about uh, mitigation and about reducing no risk through reducing rates through reducing risk. How should it be done in the bill? How should it be identified? Mitigation. What are you talking about? I'm talking about uh, what Mr. Sachs referred to, which is uh, community-wide mitigation is a better tool than even like individual what homeowners' is mitigation. What community-wide mitigation? Pardon me. What are you talking about with community-wide mitigation? What are you talking, talking about, about restoring wetlands? I'm talking about removing structures, doing buyouts in certain cases. Um, you know, the, that type of approach is going to be more beneficial to the remaining homeowners than so otherwise. You think communities should get together and come up with some money to pay for this kind of mitigation that you're talking about? We do have pre-disaster pre mitigation programs. We have programs through the Army Corps of Engineers. They're, uh, no, we not supported the Army doing Corps a, of doing mesh, um, supporting a, creating a loan program with okay, the FHA. We, we claim in my time. Yes, ma'am. You're alluding to the non-existent. And so until you can identify, and this chairman, where the money is going to come from for mitigation, I don't think it's a credible way by which to talk about reform. I yield back the balance of my time. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy, chairman of our Housing and Insurance Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wasn't going to go here either, but let's stick on uh, the $24.6 billion debt. If, uh, if that 20 4.6 billion was forgiven, um, would the program then be solvent um, next year, the year after, five years from now, or is the CBO correct in that we'll run a, a, a billion plus dollar deficit every year from this point forward? Uh, that, that's correct, Congressman. And actually, one of the largest lost years in the program's history was just last year, where really the only storm that people really think about is Hurricane Matthew and some other flooding events. And so it, it certainly, this program, while it does sort of teeter on the brink of solvency, these larger events are going to drag it down inevitably. So forgiving the debt doesn't make the program solvent. It's going to continue to run deficits, even if the debt was forgiven. Is that a fair enough point, Mr. Yes, Ellis? Congressman Duffy. Okay. Um, I, I want to just quickly talk about Grandfather and Miss Bernie, and welcome. Good to see you here. Thank you. Um, on grandfathered properties, is it only poor people who own grandfathered homes, or are there poor people, medium wealth people, and wealthy people who have properties that are grandfathered? So we would 
define grandfathering as any property that was built to code at the time of construction, uh, then when, they, when a new map is introduced in their community, that property would be able to retain so, credit for so building according right. to code. And so, so, it's that's not just, so it's not just poor people whose properties have been grandfathered, it's wealthy people who have also been grandfathered in as well, right? It's people, correct. It's people right. who did that's, everything that's that they a, that's the right answer. were told to do. That's the right answer. So it's, it's rich people, medium wealth folks, and poor people who are grandfathered. Um, and who in the program subsidizes those wealthy people who are grandfathered in the program? Isn't it all other ratepayers? So don't you actually have uh, poor people who are paying an actually a sound rate, those who aren't pre-firm or, or grandfathered, aren't they actually paying higher rates to subsidize rich people who have been grandfathered? So about the grandfathered yes no? properties, if you were built, if you've built to base flood elevation and you've built um, to that standard, then FEMA considers you as mitigating their risk against having to pay a claim. But you could be making a so million dollars a year and you could have your home that's grandfathered in and you're getting a subsidized rate that a poor person in Louisiana who's paying a higher rate to subsidize that wealthy individual. That's, that's, that's correct, isn't it? I'm not wrong on that point. I would respectfully disagree. There was a, um, a property that we often use as an example well, last about, time around. Uh, anyone, dis anyone else disagree with me on that point? Mr. Ellis, am I right on that point? Uh, yes, I agree with you, Congressman. We have poor people subsidizing rich people yeah. in the current status of this program. And the, the Government Accountability Office has documented massive cross-subsidies in the program. Yes, Mr. Sir. Sachs, do you agree with that? Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lehman? That's correct. And in addition, we don't actually, at this point, know how many grandfathered properties there are. FEMA is still studying that issue and is not expected to have a, a complete report till late I, next year. I, I find that to be outrageous that we have a program where poor people can actually subsidize rich people who can afford to pay an actually sound rate. Let's go to another point. In our bill. Happens every day. Okay. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, I missed that. But. <laughs> Um, if, if we can look out to um, four years from now, and four years from uh, the enactment of the bill, we are going to uh, remove million dollar homes from the program if your state commissioner certifies that a private market exists. Does anybody, now, if we're, I'm now not multifamily units, if we're talking just specifically um, replacement costs for an individual home of a million dollars or more, does anybody think that's bad policy on the panel? I do. Why is that? Because setting that threshold doesn't consider the cost of construction in a lot of different regions. And the example I'll give here is where you have attached homes. And the engineering itself to actually rebuild, if you need to do that, can actually cost a million dollars. Because defining single family homes is actually one to four families within a given property. So if I have my home and we rent out the top two floors because that's how we can afford to stay in our home, it may cost a million dollars or just over to actually rebuild that property. It's not so, that I am I'm so rich necessarily, but that, that, that property, which is where my family has lived and we've rented it out to be able to live there, it may cost that much. And now I'm no longer able to obtain NFIP coverage and will be forced to go to the private market. So, so um, if you have a home uh, that has a replacement cost of a million dollars or more, it's your testimony that we should not, if a private market exists, move that property into the private market, we should actually keep them in the NFIP, and potentially they could be grandfathered and they could be subsidized as well. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Lehman? No, we, we, we support the- Mr. Uh, Mr. Sachs, does that make sense to you? Our view is that all properties need to be insured at a risk-based rate, doesn't matter who provides the insurance. Mr. Ellis? I, I agree with my colleagues. Can I just ask one quick question? We're moving from 31% on the Right Your Owns Commission to 25%. Does anyone disagree with that provision of the bill? Do we have agreement there? Yes. Ms. Bernie? Yes. No? Okay. So time, time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, ranking member of our Housing and Insurance Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ellis, I, 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 I may have misunderstood you, and so um, and I looked for it in, in your written comments you didn't have, but I thought I heard you say that the private sector is clamoring uh, for greater participation. Uh, yes, sir. What private sector? 
insurance or yeah, in, in, some in, other? the insurance industry. I mean, certainly, uh, it's part of the members of some of the members of Smarter Safer are insurance companies and reinsurance companies. They're advocating for reforms to actually be able to uh, compete in the market. Certainly, um, Mr. Ross and Ms. Castor's legislation is supported by many insurance companies because they want to actually write in the flood insurance market. Well, and we've seen after bigger waters, a yeah. lot of companies start interest in New York and in. Okay. And, 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 um, Thank you. Uh, that's different than what what you said. I mean. The, uh, it, it is different because you just you, you threw the statement out and you didn't add anything to it. The, the truth of the matter is they're not clamoring for it unless there are reforms, uh, and one of the reforms would be the, the lengthening of the of the reauthorization, giving them more time to look at uh, you know what what is at risk and uh, all all components of, of insurance, including reinsurance. Uh, the other uh, question that I have uh, for Mr. Sachs and you. Um, is uh, you, you mentioned that uh, more people would be at risk as time moves on. Uh, why? Well, for an environmental perspective, we are seeing tremendous sea level rise. We're seeing land loss. We're seeing more frequent and more severe storms. And simply by not stepping up to provide mitigation and a response, the risk will continue to grow. Uh, Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, I wish I had been in Paris, uh, and with you uh, giving me those comments, um, I was reading an article in National Geographic which says that by 2021, uh, between four and 13 more uh, million Americans will be at risk, uh, from New York to South Carolina to Florida to California. Uh, as a result of climate change. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Ellis, you and I may have disagreed on something else earlier, but you also said the same thing. So, uh, climate change is having an impact uh, on national flood insurance. Is that right? Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely, Congressman. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for me uh, getting that, that information out. Uh, the other question that I have, um, is, uh, somebody mentioned grandfathering uh, earlier. Who, uh, who, who was that, who? I spoke about that. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, are you aware that the, um, that, that uh, FEMA actually doesn't even uh, keep records of, of, of grandfathering? Yes, sir, because they define the, pro the policy as actuarially rated when it's written. Mm -hmm. uh, in your opinion, is that the appropriate uh, yes, we believe this policy should be maintained so that anybody who did as they were told and followed the, the advice of the federal government and built according to the, the strong standards that FEMA sets out in their maps should be provided with protection uh, and should be given credit for doing as they were told. Okay. One, one more question. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do this quick, quickly. Uh, but I agree with the increasing policyholder holder, uh, participation in the NFIP program. Uh, Especially when you see, we had a colleague, Cedric Richmond, who represents Baton Rouge, and I think 80%, 80% mm -hmm. of, the, of the people who were adversely impacted did not have uh, any kind of uh, flood insurance. Um, what, what, is, what, what would you suggest as a means of addressing uh, this problem? 20% of all of the, of the, 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 the flood claims come from individuals who didn't have insurance. Yes, thank you for that question. You raise an important point. Uh, the Baton Rouge event that happened last August, as you referenced, about 80% of folks didn't have flood insurance. And I'm sure that's hard for y'all to understand after everything that's happened in Louisiana in the last 20 years, but or in the last 12 years, forgive me. But um, Baton Rouge is about 100 miles away from the coast. This was a riverine backwater event. It could have happened anywhere. Uh, and so we have really tried to think about ways to get people to buy more insurance. As Mr. Sachs mentioned, flooding is happening with more frequency and greater severity. And Why? So Why? Because of climate change. Oh my and goodness, so, go ahead. Um, and so, <laughs> and so uh, we believe that these, um, that these, encouraging people to buy more flood insurance both brings um, revenues and lines with costs and will provide for greater, um, protections for the taxpayer down the line as well. Ultimately, the NFIP was formed to take some, put some of the people in flood-prone areas to have more skin in the game um, 
rather than just having it all funded directly from the taxpayer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, chairman of our Financial Institutions Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and welcome to all the uh, witnesses this morning. Um, Mr. Ellis, I want to start with you this morning. There are several things I want to get to here. Reinsurance uh, and mitigation and rates are the things I want to talk about real quickly here. With regards to um, reinsurance, uh, to me it seems like it's very important. We've had the discussion already this morning about the fact that uh, we've had these major catastrophes that accumulated $24.6 billion worth of debt. And while the while FEMA uh, NFIP program has the ability to purchase reinsurance, has not done it until recently when they found out that we're going to try and force them to do it. Now they're starting to have a little pilot program where they're starting to nip around the edges on it. So I guess my, my uh, ask of you is, do you think it's a good idea Are you to put the private sector on the, uh, on the risk for this uh, excessive uh, occurrence that would happen rather than the taxpayers? Absolutely, Congressman. I think that it's important to lay off that risk on the private markets, and then the private markets can lay off that risk all around the world, um, or you know, use catastrophe bonds or other means. And that's what company insurance companies do to mitigate the risk, rather than just simply borrowing more from taxpayers. Okay. Is there enough capacity in the system that you see? Uh, my understanding was that the uh, uh, the most recent um, um, issuance was oversubscribed. That there was more companies wanting to uh, uh, sell reinsurance to NFIP than were actually able to. Mr. Lehman, I see you nodding your head. You're apparently in agreement with that? Yes, absolutely. Very good. Thank you. With regards to mapping, <clears throat> I have a kind of unique situation standpoint. I have the Lake of the Ozarks in my backyard. The Lake of the Ozarks is a man-made lake as a result of a dam. It's a hydroelectric dam that produces electricity for a local utility. And it's got, uh, because of the topography of the area, you've got 1,150 miles of shoreline, which is more miles of shoreline than the state of California. And because it's not a core lake, you can build right down on it. So as a result of this, I've got a flood insurance problem in my backyard, which is where I live the size of the state of California. So to me, mapping is extremely important. And so in the, in the, I offered a, a bill to, uh, to try and improve the ability of FEMA to be able to, to do something with their mapping process because in testimony in this committee, um, some time ago, the uh, director uh, made a statement that I asked him the question, how often do you think you're gonna get back to be able to map these, uh, these properties around the, the country. So an average of seven years. Well, that means anywhere from five to 12 years before you're gonna to get to some of these properties probably. He said, yes, that's true. So what we did in our, in our bill was say, every, if at the end of three years you haven't been able to get back to these properties, the local folks should be able to remap their own things. And I'll give you an example in, at the Lake of the Ozarks, for instance, there's 27,000 people with a piece of property around this lake. And that means you've got three or 400 Loma letters, letters of map amendment every year that cost three or four or $500 a piece this is ridiculous. So if the communities want to get together to do this, to be able to remap their communities, it seems to me like they should be able to do that. What do you think of that idea, Mr. Ellis? I think as long as there are the adequate um, safeguards and standards that it, uh, you know, it meets what the Technical Mapping Advisory Committee is, is laying out for, the, for the currently for FEMA, that that makes sense. Um, I also noted in my uh, testimony that uh, the state of North Carolina, for instance, took mapping money and actually used uh, aircraft to do LIDAR elevation data um, in their higher risk counties. And so that's certainly an area where they took the bull by the horns and, and did a better job for their consumers and actually made all that information available online. Mr. Bernie, would that be helpful in your area? Allow the local communities to be able to remap everything to make sure they're accurate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the big things we've advocated for is greater local stakeholder involvement. We have seen, though, that a lot of times local communities oftentimes don't even have the funding to appeal the maps. So uh, we would request or respectfully request that the committee just consider um, funding for additional mapping increases. But yes, we would support. Um, this proposal and additional uh, local stakeholder input and in mapping. Thank you very much. With regards to the uh, replacement cost rates, we've had a discussion on this a little bit, but it seems to me, you know, one of the things that uh, we did, I've offered a bill with regards to this, and basically it takes the Florida model, which shows that it can be done and done successfully. Uh, but what we're doing is the average home is $167,000, and basically people under $167,000 are supporting and subsidizing those above it when you have one rate across the board. It'd be like if you had a $167,000 house, but yours was only $50,000 in value versus $250,000 value, but you're charged one, one, one premium across the board. To me, this is nuts. This doesn't take into account the value of the property. So I think it's very important we get back to replacement cost 
Values. Mr. Thiemann, what do you think about that? I know you had some testimony with regards to risk-based rates. Right. My understanding is so FEMA's current methodology uses a, a sort of a national average for replacement costs as opposed to uh, property level rep replacement costs or even local repla replacement costs. Uh, th there would have to be a process. I, I know that there are contractors who provide that data, data and analytics firms. It would seem um, to me they'd also make the, the rates more competitive. From absolutely. The Currently, there's no doubt that a, a, a a property that is more more expensive to repair. Yeah, so if you've got is, a lower income is, folks that's got to fix that house, they, yeah. they, even though we would restructure the program, they're going to get a break on the, on this premium. So That's correct. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentle lady from New York, Ms. Maloney, ranking member of our Capital Markets Subcommittee. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd, I'd like to, first of all, thank the City of New York and Mayor de Blasio's office for commissioning a RAND study of uh, flood insurance for New York, which uh, examines a number of different policy options to ensure that flood insurance is available and affordable for middle class families. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent to place in the record the RAND report. Without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to ask Ms. Uh, Stern, Sternhell, uh, section two, of the Flood Risk Mit Mitigation Act would penalize communities with more than 50 repetitive lost properties or more than five severe repetitive lost properties if they don't have a community-wide plan for addressing these specific properties. And uh, my question is, does it make sense for entire communities to have to develop a plan to deal with just five properties and to potentially be kicked out of the National Flood Insurance Program if they don't make sufficient progress on, 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 on this plan. And aren't these uh, thresholds way too, too low? What is your opinion? On having a plan, absolutely yes. I agree we should. On being kicked out, absolutely not. And on the thresholds, yes, they are far too low, um, especially when you consider some of the size of the communities. New York City's floodplain has, based on the P firms that are undergoing revision right now, have over 70,000 structures. So it's one thing if you have a few hundred structures and say, okay, five very bad apples, and you need to deal with this. It's another thing if you have over tens of thousands of structures. Um, moreover, sometimes these properties aren't located in, co in contiguous regions. You know, we have the five boroughs, for example. We could have problems in Staten Island, two opposite sides of the island, a property in Queens, and then, you know, two in Brooklyn on miles away from one another. You know, we are happy to develop plans, but at what cost then to deal with these and to remedy these, and, and what then becomes available to us? I mean... Would the committee be suggesting we utilize eminent domain or something that severe to remedy these properties? And, and with what funding available, given um, pre-disaster mitigation funding is not hugely available and it's not nearly robust enough to meet the need of the nation? And, and do you think it's fair for entire communities to be sanctioned under this provision? No, I don't. And FEMA already has some authorities to suspend communities for failure to manage their floodplains properly. Um, I don't know why we would need these new additional sanctions or provisions to kick whole communities out. Um, certainly, again, we, we absolutely endorse developing new rigorous floodplain management plans, but not at the expense of, or not such that we could eventually be kicked out because we're trying our best. Okay, now, now I'd like to ask you also about Section 8 of the National Flood Insurance Pro Int Integrity Improvement Act uh, would prohibit these policies altogether after four years for new structures that are either in special flood hazard areas that, or that have a replacement cost of more than a million dollars. Even if FEMA temporarily waives this prohibition, which it can only do for one year at a time, and only if private market insurance is not available, there'll be a 10% surcharge on these policies for these new structures. How would this provision affect <coughs> New York City? Well, it would create real problems in terms of redevelopment on the floodplain and three issues, really. First, the one from the taxpayer perspective of whether you'll have NFIP versus not, you know, depending on whether the state goes ahead and, and makes the case. Um, it's entirely possible that there's 10 percent market penetration in one part of the city, but not elsewhere. But now that person and that homeowner is foreclosed from accessing the NFIP. So that gets to choice. And foreclosing the choice, I mean, we do, we do not object to people going out and getting private insurance. If they get a better rate, Go ahead. But foreclosing the op option of the NFIP is a real problem. Second, and, and do you think it's fair for homeowners to be penalized, uh, really, for the private market's failure? 
No, I don't. Not at all. It's not and available usually. Okay. Certainly, yeah. some development can actually help make communities more resilient. Even, um, you know, taking over a parking lot and yeah. putting resilient housing there can actually protect a neighborhood. And as you noted in your testimony, in some ways, flood insurance is very different in New York City. For example, some mitigation options that are available in other communities, such as elevating the house, are, it's simply not an option in New York City when you have tall buildings, 50 stories and even higher. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that. And, and, and the mitigation options that we do have in New York don't get enough credit in the current program. So do any of these flood insurance bills address this issue? Not to the degree we would like to see. And could more be done to make sure that the mitigation options that are available to large urban areas like New York get the credit they deserve for lowering risk to the National Flood Insurance Program? Yes, if I may very quickly answer. Quickly. Yes, if we could actually look and see that if mechanicals are a big part of every claim, let's lift the mechanicals. And then let's reduce the premium because we got things out of harm's way. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, chairman of our Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for appearing today to discuss the reauthorization of the flood insurance program, which is, as we all know, set to expire uh, this year in September. This is an important issue for the St. Louis region, and in particular, my second congressional district, which has seen two major floods, in fact, two 500-year floods in less than two years. Uh, with the NFIP being $24.6 billion in debt, as has been duly noted, it's important to make sure that there are reforms to the program necessary to keep it solvent and continue providing coverage for those who live in the areas that truly need it. To help offset this burden um, on the NFIP, I believe a strong private market is important for offering consumers more than one choice and giving them flexibility and options and oftentimes greater affordability uh, in the coverage they are seeking. Mr. Lehman, uh, when the NFIP was created in 1968, the belief was that the private insurance markets lacked the data um, uh, and the ability to assess flood losses. What's changed in terms of data, technology, and the market's ability to assess risk since then, sir? Uh, so there, there's a couple aspects. Uh, there, is, there is the issue of the, uh, modeling is the first major answer. Uh, modeling was introduced in the 1980s and, and has, has progressed significantly since then. Um, also in, in the 60s, uh, you still had a lot of smaller uh, regional insurance companies that were had solvency risk and not a not the deep reinsurance markets that we have today. Um, so the market has changed significantly in larger companies. It is a global industry uh, where risk gets gets sort of segmented and chopped up and sent around the world, um, which is which is a good thing. In in keeping risk on our shores is not something that we want to want to encourage. Do you believe, uh, sir, that the the private that private capital would retreat from the market in those cycles where there are significant floods, for instance? There is a noted in the property casualty insurance industry cycle of uh, capacity expanding and rates dropping and capacity shrinking and rates increasing. So that's normal, um, but it is a cycle. When, when rates go up, that attracts more capital and it brings rates back down again. Uh, so we saw that after Katrina. We certainly saw it after September 11th. Uh, we have been in a soft market for some time. So even Sandy did not have the effect of, of making capital retreat. Uh, it, it has stayed soft all through that. Interesting. Um, your testimony refutes the notion that private sector uh, cherry picking yeah. uh, the lowest risk properties will destabilize the NFIP which is something we hear often, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. Can you provide more detail on that? So I, I would not dispute that uh, subsidized properties are unlikely to be moved out of the NFIP until they pay risk-based rates. Mm -hmm. right? that, that is true. Uh, but it is not the level of risk. There are subsidized properties that are higher and lower risk. Uh, there are high-risk properties that pay relatively a lot for the risk that they face. And there are low-risk properties that don't pay enough. Uh, so it is, it is a question of, does the risk match the premium? 
Uh, those, will, those where the, the premium exceeds the risk will be the first to go, but that's not the same thing as cherry picking. Mm -hmm. The program itself is a high risk program and every policyholder in that program uh, present, presents a, a cost, a potential cost uh, to the taxpayers, which is why on an annual basis, it's not actuarially sound. Will private insurance companies uh, need to take on higher risk properties they, in order to, to kind of chase the yield? They, they will take on high risk properties where, that, where the high risk property presents an appropriate return for them. It's certainly what I live in Florida, and that is something we've seen in Florida in the citizens uh, depopulation program that high-risk properties, particularly in South Florida, are uh, among the most attractive to the private market. Which barriers with the NFIP um, prevent private insurance from entering the market, and how do these legislative drafts today mm -hmm. help solve some of those problems, Ms. Lehman? Sure. So there, there remains some confusion about uh, what counts uh, for the mandatory purchase agreement, um, the Ross Castor language looks to address that. Mm -hmm. uh, we do think there's still some confusion even with that bill in that the federal the banking regulators have not weighed in yet. We don't know when they will. Um, and so in the, in the interim, we would like that language to be self-executing uh, so that where a, a, a state insurance commissioner decides that, uh, uh, determines that a policy is appropriate, that it, it will meet the mandatory purchase requirement. That's the, that's the top. My time's expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Velasquez. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me take this opportunity to thank you and uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Duffy, for working with me to address so many of the claims processing problems uh, New Yorkers face after Sandy. I was pleased to see many sections of my bill were included in the discussion drafts we are reviewing today. While I have concerns with portions of these discussion drafts, it is my hope that we can continue to work in a bipartisan manner to address these concerns and pass a long-term reauthorization of the program. Ms. Sternhall, as you know, New Yorkers were devastated uh, by Hurricane Sandy, particularly my congressional district. Following the storm, there weren't enough qualified, licensed engineers available to assess home, homeowners' damage, exacerbating many of the problems uh, homeowners face after the storm. Can you please speak to the importance of having qualified licensed engineers participate in the assessment of storm damage? Certainly, I mean, I think it comes down to trust and trusting that what you're being told is, is fact and you can trust and rely upon what they're telling you as you proceed not only to rebuild but to pursue your claim um, you know, we dealt with an analogous situation with the rapid repairs program. We needed licensed electricians and plumbers immediately available to come and do work so we know work was being done correctly. And that was such a big part of the, the claims process and the frauds where you would have individuals who maybe weren't engineers, and maybe were assessors but didn't necessarily have skills or weren't equipped to deal with the certain situations they were presented with. So we would absolutely endorse this provision. Thank you. Um, I'm Ms. Turnhall. In your testimony, you suggest that a provision be included in the NFIP policy contracts that notifies policyholders that they cannot waive their right to appeal, litigate, or review documents in a contract. Can you explain why inclusion of such a provision is important to a homeowner pursuing a food claim, a flood claim? Certainly, when people are in a vulnerable state, I mean, we would like to ensure that they preserve their rights. They may not need to exercise them, but they retain those rights. And so we would not want to see a situation where, by virtue of signing an insurance agreement or maybe even having an assessor or a just or you, anybody come by and ask you to sign a waiver of some sort, you no longer have the remedies you're entitled to under this legislation. Thank you. And the national, uh, Ms. Sternhall, the National Flood Insurance Program Policyholder Protection and Information Act of 2017 requires the FEMA administrator to consider the differences in properties located in coastal and inland areas when calculating annual premium rates. What would this provision mean for policyholders living in the coastal areas of the U.S., many of whom already pay higher premiums than most other NFIP policyholders? I know that there was an exchange previously, but I would like to offer this opportunity for you to expand on how it's going to impact uh, those who live in 
coastal areas. Certainly, I mean, what is confusing a little bit about this provision is that coastal residents already pay V zones. And so there's already a, a mechanism within the program to, to actuarially rate coastal properties um, with the V zone designation. So that already is, is present um, within the NFIP program. What will this provision mean for the residents of New York City specifically? To be honest, Congresswoman, I'm not exactly sure. What I would hate to see is that further divisions that aren't based on um, sort of accurate mapping or um, actuarial principles further creating a divide. You know, not only do we have Coastal V, but we also have riverine communities. Um, so we have the full gamut and understand the, the, the spectrum of rates and zones that can be available. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinga, chairman of our Capital Markets Subcommittee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to try to, I've got a lot of material, I'll try to move along quickly. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, you, Mr. Ellis. Um, as pointed out by uh, Chair Wagner, um, you know, 1968, we might not have had the, the ability to do what we can do today as far as data collection and, and uh, all those things. But how would you gauge the private sector's um, appetite for entering the flood insurance marketplace? And how much of that, how much of what currently is in that public space do, you, uh, do we estimate that they could uh, absorb? Well, as I uh, indicated in my testimony, uh, Congressman, and, uh, you know, and this kind of gets to the comments about clamoring, uh, that, that actually under the current provisions of, of the flood insurance program, so with no further reforms, we have about 20 companies that are writing uh, first dollar flood insurance in the state of Florida, and they're writing in all the various risk profiles. That's where 40% of the NFIP policies are. So, I mean, clearly there is an interest there. And it also would get to, I think, one of the, one of the questions about getting more people with flood insurance. The more we normalize the flood insurance experience, that it's part of a rider on your existing homeowner's policy, more people are going to be insured. And that's what we should be uh, trying to get, is more Americans actually having flood insurance than do today. So you don't have what happened in Baton Rouge, where you don't have so many people um, actually only getting a few thousand dollars in disaster response instead of getting, in that case, $87,000 in flood insurance payments. Okay. And do consumers benefit when there's only one choice? Absolutely, Congressman. And, and as I said before, the only reason why anyone would opt for a private policy is they got a better price or a better product or both. Okay. Um, all right. And, and um, I'm sorry, is it Ms. Bernie? Yes. All right. Uh, Layman, um, you know, we've learned a lot of, oh, we, hopefully we've learned a number of things since 1968. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what uh, you believe has changed in terms of data, technology, markets' abilities to assess risk, uh, and, and, um, and since 2012, what happened with the development of a, of a private flood insurance market? Well, uh, since 2012, a lot of it did start with bigger waters, um, and the, the acknowledgement that subsidized rates were going to start to recede, and that grandfathered rates, uh, that was... Was that pun intended? Yes. On the flood. Yes. Uh, th that there would there would be risk based rates that we would be gra gradually moving towards risk based rates did in did begin to interest uh, private insurers in writing much much more than they had been um, among other th among the things that have changed uh, that is that has brought in more private capital is simply the fact that home prices have increased right so we we have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar statutory limit. Um, and so you have much more umbrella coverage, access coverage. Uh, in, private insurers are writing that. They're becoming comfortable with the risk. They're, they're buying reinsurance for it. And they're, they're, once they get to that level of comfort, they're ready to, but, to write it at the first dollar. But you, you, you believe that consumers should be involved and engaged in this, right? Absolutely. OK. How about, how about local entities, local governments? Certainly, yes. Uh, I mean, the, the, we, we support uh, Mr. Sachs's, uh, 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 his, his proposals of, of community-based uh, mitigation. We think that that's, that's I, appropriate. And, and of course, in addition to hardening properties, elevating yeah. and, and so forth. Well, I, I think that's what, that's what a lot of us are concerned with. Yeah. I, I grew up in a flood zone, in a flood plain. Um, we had to lobby our local county road commission to change a bridge that they tried to say moved as much water, and clearly it didn't because we haven't been flooded or our parents hadn't been flooded. Um, and I, I know, and I'm so sorry, I can't see the name tag from, from New York, uh, Stanhill, right? Sternhill. Yeah. Um, I, we did just pull uh, the uh, Mayor de Blasio's uh, executive budget, uh, 82.2 billion. 
Uh, my understanding is the RAND uh, Corporation, the most aggressive mitigation grant and loan uh, estimation was 100 million uh, of that. Um, and as I, as I do the math here, I think that's .00121655% of I'll the entire New York City budget. <laughs> And it seems to me at some point or another, we have to have our local entities step into that gap uh, as well. And with that, my time has expired. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I too want to thank uh, you and the ranking member and Mr. Duffy, uh, Mr. Cleaver, uh, for working on this bill and trying to make it a bipartisan bill for surely uh, when we talk about these floodwaters, and uh, I believe uh, as a result of global uh, climate change, uh, this is an area that we need to figure something out because it comes to all regions of the country. Uh, it affects you know, all parties and all individuals. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can continue in that same vein and working together and ultimately come up with a product that is good for everyone. Uh, with that, uh, I was intrigued in listening to some of the conversation, the questions and answers going back and forth. And, you know, I come from a district that was devastated uh, by Hurricane uh, Sandy uh, and, uh, and this whole issue uh, of dealing with uh, grandfathering is extremely important to me. Uh, if you look at the communities uh, in my district, especially those in Nassau County and on the Rockaway Peninsula, uh, you find individuals who are, um, uh, many of them are not rich, they're not rich, many of them are not poor, but they are all middle class, hard working individuals who are trying to live the best that they can in the American dream. They made sacrifices to own their home. So I'd like to ask Ms. Kagan Sternhill uh, first um, about this, these uh, grandfathering uh, provisions and what happens if they were removed, uh, you know, because, you know, when I talk to my constituents, some will just talk about how their premiums would increase by thousands of dollars, and then they couldn't afford the homes because they're paying day-to-day, -day, struggling day-to-day -to, -day to pay their mortgage, et cetera. Then what happens to these hardworking middle-class Americans? So may you elaborate on the value of grandfathering and the implications removing grandfathering would have on the affordability of a house for a hardworking middle-class family? Yes, and I mean, to what Caitlin's elaborated on and others, you know, we believe grandfathering is important because where you have built a code and done as you have been told, uh, you should not sort of be penalized as, as the world changes around you necessarily. Now, that's not to say that the communities and, and the city itself is undertaking a number of mitigation measures and certainly around your district with a rockaway hardening. Um, but so for the, a lot of these individuals, that's part of the reason we commissioned the RAND study. Uh, to look at what this means and develop a thing called a pity ratio, which looks at sort of the cost of carrying a home, independent of just necessarily home value or income, certainly factoring income in, but whether you're insurance burdened, um, which actually hits at some of these middle class individuals and these homeowners to say, okay, by virtue of these insurance rate increases or 1%, 2%, what have you, uh, it becomes unaffordable to even live in your home. And so that's why grandfathering was sort of highlighted in, in that report as one of the most effective tools. And then one of the more co even more cost effective tools was actually means, test, means tested targeted vouchers or credits uh, to help individuals uh, stay in their homes. Thank you. And I also I want to stay with you, uh, Ms. Sternhill, mm -hmm. um, because I think in your testimony you noted that proposals to disallow uh, the National Flood Insurance Program coverage for new construction in special flood hazard areas are misguided. I think that's what your word, and, and, and from what I read, I think I agree with you, considering that approximately 400,000 New Yorkers live in these areas, and a small alternative would be to require sustainable construction in high-risk communities, I believe. For example, in New York, we saw new construction in New York City communities, including Battery Park and Auburn by the sea, uh, where it emerged relatively unscathed from Hurricane Sandy because they were built for resiliency. Uh, could you provide an alternative proposal that would protect taxpayers from risk, yet maintain NFIP's accessibility to homeowners in flood prone areas like Nassau County and the Rockaways? Absolutely. And so for individual homeowners, 
um, you know, the city immediately changed its building code following Hurricane Sandy, such that any new construction has to be built to what the current FEMA standard is, plus additional feet of freeboard. And so that if anything is going to be rebuilt, you have to be building to a more resilient standard and one that considers the environment. So there are sort of city level things we can do in addition to the Staten Island seawall and programs like the Staten Island Blue Belts, which are actual wetlands uh, that we have built that do ponding and where you can't actually have great drainage. They will actually feed in, absorb water and drain it out to the sea, further uh, protecting communities just as Mr. Sachs has talked about. So we absolutely endorse the green infrastructure options. Um, and again, sort of general routing and with an eye to new construction codes, continuing to make sure that if we are going to put um, things within our floodplain, that we do so um, in a smart manner and with ways that truly consider uh, what's going to happen in the next 10, 20, 15 years. Thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Ross for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for having this hearing today. I think this is something that um, is long overdue, and especially in light of the expiration of the NFIP by the end of September. Uh, we have our work cut out for us. And, and as we go back over the last 50 years since the NFIP was created in 1968, uh, a time when we were trying to put men on the moon and technology was at its uh, infancy as we know it today. Um, we also saw that there were limited building codes, limiting, limited zoning restrictions, urban sprawl, and therefore uh, a market that just did not want to participate in the flood insurance arena, and so therefore we engaged the federal government with warnings knowing that if we did so for very long, it would create a moral hazard, which we are at today. Uh, so my, my concern is, is, and I'll start with you, Mr. Ellis, is in 1968, one of the underlying reasons for uh, the National Flood Insurance Program, was that there was not available technology, mapping, and data that would justify being able to accurately assess the risk, and therefore we couldn't place it on the market. What's happened since then? I mean, have we seen an advancement that might make it a little bit more um, realistic as to what the risk may be? I, I would venture, Congressman, that my iPhone probably has about as much computing power as a whole Built a whole room did at that time of, of computers. And so I think that we have moved dramatically um, in you know, technological advances in modeling, and Mr. Lehman referred to some of these earlier, and, and that we're, we're in a much different place. And then also just the way the insurance industry has changed dramatically in that time frame and about being able to lay off risk worldwide. And so we're just in a different place where it makes sense to shift more of the risk to the private sector. And we've seen a greater capacity. Would you not agree that there is sufficient capacity out there in the private sector to come in and take a sizable, if not all, of the risk that's being borne by the NFIP? Uh, absolutely. And, and, and probably beyond that, hopefully, is taking on more and more people get flood insurance. Absolutely, Congressman. But the barriers that have been created over the last 50 years have allowed us to kind of limit the involvement of the private sector, except for what's come back since 2012. So my, my, my purpose here today is to, to uh, quite frankly, uh, talk about the, modern, uh, the my, my Insurance modern, Modernization Parity Act that I filed last year that we passed overwhelmingly in this House. And my concern is this is that we desperately need to have the seeding of capital or the risk to private capital in order to make a viable market that's competitive and good for the consumers. Would it not be a good first step to make sure that we allow for those barriers of private capital to be broken down, to allow the state regulators to do what they do best, not only in terms of solvency, but consumer protections, and at the same time allow to exist, which has been for the last 50 years, the safety net of the NFIP, so if those consumers out there feel prejudice, they won't be. Absolutely, Congressman. And you actually undersold your bill. It wasn't just overwhelmingly. It was 419 to zero, um, which is not very many substantive pieces of legislation pass uh, unanimously in the House. And so, absolutely. And this is just a common sense approach that there was never an intent that people couldn't buy private flood insurance. There's no prohibition that you shouldn't be able to buy flood insurance. And this just says, all right, as long as you get something that's comparable, you can actually have that and meet your mandatory purchase requirement. And, and as a result, we created a subsidy, an, a, subsidi a subsidized market that in effect flies in the face of the laws of economics because, Mr. Lehman, as you pointed out, there may be a spike in rates, but it's not rates that creates the problem. It's the return on the investment of that capital that put, that, that's at risk. So in other words, if you have capital that's at risk, but you can reduce that risk. You can get a higher rate of return, but yet have a less rate that you're charging the consumer. Is that not true? That's absolutely true. And the only way that happens, though, is if you bring that capital in to assess that risk. So instead of having the NFIP out there saying we're going to just do a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, policy premium, 
we actually invite those carriers to come in and do what they do best, and that's put their capital at risk and manage that risk. And if we're going to make this change to where we want people to feel as though they have not only the comfort of knowing they're insured, but also to know that they are going to be able to find it at an affordable rate, we have to open up the markets. And so my next question is, and I would offer this to the panel, is what significance is mitigation? I mean, we've got housing stock out there that has been built for years. We've got uh, uh, no aggressive policy to try to make these more resilient, to, to remediate them. Who would like to just in 30 seconds address mitigation? Well, Congressman, if I could, I would like to say, of course, mitigation is the key to affordability. It's also an essential right now. And we've had a lot of discussion about grandfathered properties and, and subsidized rates. And I'd say one of the troubles with properties like that is they're not sending a market signal that's encouraging people to take matters into their own hands and take pre-disaster mitigative action. Which is absolutely necessary. And maybe we should do it through tax incentives. Maybe we should do it through private uh, public partnerships with some of our building supply companies that can come in there and, and allow them to, 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 to finance at zero or no rate uh, to, to be able to do this, this, this mitigation that's so necessary. I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, my major concern is making sure that those families that are most at risk can obtain the affordable flood insurance. And that's, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might uh, say a word to you on that, is what is missing in this bill. Let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. In this bill, uh, my Republican friends have put into this bill what is referred to as a voluntary buyout program. And my understanding is that it is to discourage a re repetitively flooded properties from rebuilding after flooding. But there's no money there. I mean, if we ever had a glaring example, uh, Mr. Chairman, as to why we need to enlarge this, um, uh, it is important that we have a bipartisan flood insurance bill. And I believe we're going to have one. But I want to make this point. FEMA has declared that for every dollar that we spend on flood insurance to help people, we save the taxpayers $4. I think that is gone from here, and I'm very perplexed by it. But there is in this bill a buyout program. Now, how can you buy something out when you don't have money attached to the program. Can I get the panel to address this? Uh, Mr. Sachs, let me start with you because uh, I enjoyed your commentary. You talked about uh, mitigation. You talked about increased uh, funding and not increased funding, but you did talk about affordability and mitigation. Here you got this program. And I think it has some promise. It's a good program. But how can you have a buyout program and you don't have any money attached to it to do the buyout? Well, thank you, Congressman. And I do believe that the, the committee should find more ways to invest in mitigation. And I offered some solutions to that in my testimony. With regard to the buyouts, um, I believe the intent is that that would draw on existing programs that currently pay for buyouts, and this would target people into it, but I'm not sure of that. Um, but there, see, there, there is, is existing my, money currently for buyouts in the flood program. There is my point. Because let's be realistic here. Where are the buyout possibilities? Where is the greatest impact of this? You know where it is? It's in the lower income areas. It's in where developers went in without adequate map mapping, built housing on the lower plain, and you know who moved into those? It weren't your wealthy people. They got money and they got enough sense to know that why am I gonna buy a house in a low plain area? So my point is, 
Uh, what I want from the committee, if, uh, from you all, is to share uh, with the chairman and with this committee that we need to do more on mitigation, affordability, and if we got a great program like this for a voluntary buyout, buyout understand that the greatest impact we can make for FEMA's investment return of every dollar uh, they get four for the taxpayers, we have to look at it, the fact it's the lower income. It is people that don't have that choice, who see a home developed there and boom. I'm a living witness to this. Three years ago, Atlanta's whole metro area was flooded. Um, Six Flags Over Georgia, which is in my district, you all saw it. We went and got President, Vice President Joe Biden, who flew down with us, who looked at it. And you know who lived in those areas? They were lower income people. They can't do it. So I, I think in our, in our haste to, and I'm very hasty in saving the taxpayers money, but a return of $4 for everyone, help us get to that point, and we'll have a bipartisan bill. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Holtgren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all so much for being here. This is an important discussion and uh, something that we've, we've got to get done. Uh, we've got to make sure that there isn't any type of lapse. Uh, and I, I think there's basically, among most of us, uh, shared commitment that we want to make sure that people can afford flood insurance uh, that need it, uh, but also that we, as best as we can, make sure that taxpayers aren't on the hook, that we get markets working again, and that's really what I want to see happen. So uh, thank you for uh, the information that you've given to us and the important steps that we're taking, and hopefully we can move this forward quickly and uh, get some important work done so that uh, markets are not disrupted at all, that, uh, that this can keep flowing. My constituents, uh, my district's just west of Chicago, uh, but uh, many of my constituents live in floodplain areas along the Fox River uh, or in the Lake Country, which is kind of in the northern counties of Illinois. Uh, in fact, Illinois has the nation's largest inland system of rivers, lakes, and streams, and 12% of the entire land area in Illinois is mapped as flo floodplain. Uh, what's important, though, for all my constituents, whether li they live in a high-risk area or not, uh, is to understand the risks of their own property and also that they're empowered to make responsible decisions of how to manage that risk. I remain eager to hear ideas about how to reform, uh, really, uh, I think most of us would agree, a broken flood insurance program, $25 billion in debt and growing. It just isn't sustainable. It's irresponsible government, and it's unfair to taxpayers. We also have to make sure, though, that flood insurance remains available to those who need it and choose it to use it uh, responsibly. I want to uh, address my first question uh, to Mr. Ellis, if I may. Uh, in your testimony, you say, and I quote, masking subsidies with lower rates prevents policyholders from understanding the true, their true level of risk, end quote. Wonder if you could expand on the moral hazards that subsidies create and would a change to how this subsidy is delivered uh, help consumers make more informed decisions regarding flood insurance? Thank you, Congressman. And you know, I would argue that the, the fundamental basic responsibility of government is to protect their constituents. And yet you have this program where one, people are being subsidized to live and continue to live in harm's way. And that's one of the things that, that, that bewilders me somewhat in talking about um, artificially holding down rates rather than doing other things to, to uh, uh, make flood insurance more affordable. And uh, also the other thing that I would, I would uh, point out is that the, the discussion draft that was provided did have a bunch of transparency measures so that we actually have an effective risk communication, that people understand that they're at higher risk, which could incentivize them to mitigate their risk um, and, and, and better, have a better understanding. That's great. I mean, that's absolutely what we want is where possible to make sure that good decisions are made to mitigate risk. I think it also just uh, drives us crazy when we see these repeat offender properties uh, that so much money is poured into. Uh, we've got to continue to figure that out and deal with that. I wonder, Mr. Sachs, if I could uh, jump to you. Uh, one of the provisions in the draft legislation, which was also included in Ranking Member Waters' proposal, would prohibit the NFIP from selling new policy coverage to future structures built in today's highest risk areas. 
By limiting future risk into the NFIP, what effect would this have on the fiscal health of the program? And do you believe that this risk in uh, the private market would, is this a risk the private market would be willing to take on? First, I'll, I'll answer back in reverse order. I believe, yes, the private market would take this risk on, and they've said as much. I think for the view of the National Wildlife Federation, our interest has always been that rates send a market signal to slow development, and, and we continue to support that notion. Okay. Um, I'm going to finish up uh, with Mr. Lehman, if I could, and wonder if you can go into this and maybe open it up to others as well. But uh, one of the most fundamental uh, aspects of the National Flood Insurance Program, and, and for all flood insurance, uh, is reliable data and accurate mapping. And it's been one of the, I think, greatest frustrations for many of my constituents and other folks in Illinois is frustration that the maps just don't mm -hmm. really reflect the risk. Uh, despite dramatic developments in uh, flood modeling and mapping technology, the average map is 35 years old, according to the Association of State Flood Plain Managers. How can the entire flood insurance system, private and non-private entities, better utilize the available technology and then wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit about uh, your views of the value of uh, LiDAR technology, uh, light detection, uh, and ranging uh, technology. Sure, and that's been mentioned by other witnesses. Uh, before, we, we know about uh, North Carolina's experience with LiDAR. Uh, we think that that is uh, a valuable tool. We, we think FEMA should be required to use it. Uh, LiDAR and other modern methods to get property level data, uh, which would also help with uh, many of the uh, subsidized properties that currently don't have flood elevation certificates, 97% of them don't have flood elevation certificates. Thank you all so much. I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Christ. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank Chairman Hensterling and Ranking Member Waters for holding this important hearing today. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses uh, for taking of your time to be with us and uh, share your expertise. As my Florida colleagues can attest to you, uh, our state is the biggest player in flood insurance in the country. And within Florida, uh, my home, Pinellas County, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, is ground zero. We are literally a peninsula, Pinellas County is on the peninsula of Florida. We are surrounded by water. Uh, my constituents rely on the National Flood Insurance Program for economic security as well as peace of mind, which is why it's so important uh, that we reauthorize this program on time and why I'm concerned to see that some of these drafts don't contain legislative language that would do that, uh, because I think that is our number one priority. It is my hope and my belief that this will be remedied very quickly. It's also my hope that we can work together to address some of the affordability concerns that I have and others share. It's clear that these bills propose several changes to address both affordability as well as solvency. Ms. Sternhell, taken together, uh, do you believe that these bills will decrease or increase the cost for policyholders? I believe ultimately they will increase the cost of policyholders. Uh, the city's position is that if you can get a private flood policy, please go ahead. And we're not, we do not object to uh, individuals in the private market being able to count as part of your uh, mandatory purchase requirement. But what that will then do will start to encourage and especially if the, the non-compete agreements fall away, as currently presented in this, legis in this legislation, will encourage individuals to come in and private, in private entities to come in and take the less risky policies. They may be located in a V-zone, but it may not be a risky policy. And as Mr. Lehman himself has testified, it needs to make market sense. They need to make a profit. And even in the study, uh, the Reinsurance Association cited by a number of the p panelists here today, um, they even note that, that for policies to come out of NFIP and to make sense, they have to be profitable for the private insurance industry. Mm -hmm. NFIP was created because it was a market failure. And so by its very nature, it has high risk policies and people who could not necessarily get coverage in the private market. What this is trying to do and by forcing people to private coverage, it may not be affordable for them. By foreclosing the option of NFIP and not leaving that as an option with the alternative only being private, it may become more unaffordable for them and for that we are very concerned. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bernie, would you agree? Forgive me. Yes, I would agree. Um, as Ms. Sternhell mentioned, with the, between the floors going up from 
5% to 9%, and also the increases in the surcharges, uh, we're very concerned that this would overall increase the cost of, um, of the policy for folks across America. Thank you. Um, in my home of Pinellas County, 69% of all policies in the special flood hazard area are non-waterfront and have home values of just 170,000 or less. This is the middle class. These are working families. Uh, this is the American dream for them. We have the power and moral responsibility to help these folks. But if our committee puts flood insurance out of reach for the middle class, those families in my district and elsewhere would have done everything right, but they could lose it all. Uh, I am certain that it's not the intent of this legislation and that we can work together to produce a strong, timely, as well as affordable reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. I yield my time back, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again. Gentleman yields back, Chair, and I'll recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Pittenger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of you for your testimony today and your, your good uh, thoughts and counsel. Uh, Chad Bergenis, Executive Director of the Association of State Floodplain Managers, mentioned in his testimony in March of this year the uh, term of freeboard. Uh, which means the community has adopted a building standard that's higher than the base flood evaluation for a 100-year floodplain. What would be the impact of a national standard requiring all newly constructed properties to meet this freeboard standard? Start with you, Mr. Ellis. Um, we haven't taken a position on national building uh, standards. We think that we've done some things in advocating in disaster relief that states that actually do have stronger building standards that that would, that would make sense. Um, also, we have supported um, the uh, uh, floodplain federal, the, basically that any federal investments um, actually go to having a higher uh, free board, but we haven't talked about it for uh, homeowners and all development. If I may. Uh we also, in the city of or in New Orleans, um, we have an additional uh, foot of freeboard that's required in our building codes, and um, we're, you know, we're working very hard to make sure that we are increasing mitigation and increasing standards and making our community um, more flood resilient as well. And so we are taking those st steps proactively. I would say that that is an important part to reducing flood risk, but only one part of the puzzle, and many of the other mitigation steps I talked about today also need to be included. Thank you. I would say from New York City's perspective, within months of Hurricane Sandy hitting, the, the City Council went ahead and changed the building code, and we now require two feet of freeboard um, for new development. Thank you. And I just echo Mr. Ellis's comments. Thank you. Well, in North Carolina this last year, we suffered an enormous flood, thousand-year flood from Matthew. I've uh, much of that is in my district. I have a very rural district, and uh, two of the counties were the hardest hit in the state and uh, were devastating. I was there for the third time going over that region this, just this last week with our sheriffs. Uh, I had interesting conversations with uh, the mayors and the sheriffs of each of these towns. Uh, these are small towns, Laurenburg, uh, Fayetteville, Hope Mills, uh, saw you know, all the homes been abandoned. And I asked him the question, I said, what is our responsibility in our government uh, toward uh, NFIP uh, relative to people building a new construction? And uh, they were, some were, one was Democrat, two were Republicans, so it wasn't a Republican issue. But it was a, it's a moral concern to me of the obligation that we have as legislators and representatives of the taxpayers. So to the person, they all said, well, we really believe that uh, there should not be an engagement if, um, uh, for new construction because um, that is something that it seems to, uh, would um, incentivize people to continue the, the same uh, obligation and, and losses. What are y'all's thoughts on that? Well, certainly. I mean, one of the things that was brought up when uh, Congressman Meeks was talking about uh, uh, or was doing his conversation was about the development in, in New York City and that, you know, the denying flood insurance to some of these higher risk developments, um, future developments. Uh, to me, if they're building appropriately, if they're building to mitigate the risk, the private sector is going to come in. It's going to be something that is affordable, and it's something that's going to be interesting to them. And so well, I do it think it is that affordable, and it is a uh, prudent um, investment and a business opportunity for private insurance. Then, do we really need NFIP? 
I think that we're going to have to have NFIP in this, in, at least in some form in the, in the near term, and we're eventually, hopefully, transitioning to having more Americans buying flood insurance and having a, a more robust private flood insurance market. Do you, do you understand the moral obligation we have of, of um, causing this issue to continue exacerbating the problem? Well, absolutely, and that's the, what I, I think, and as I said before, with the fundamental responsibility of government is to protect their constituents, to protect their people, and yet we have a program that subsidizes and encourages people not to just build in harm's way, but to remain in harm's way, to keep to them the point, at risk. Excuse me, just to the point, um, we do have a responsibility to protect the taxpayer. A absolutely. And apparently there hadn't been enough of that since we're $24 billion in debt. Anybody else have any more comments? We've got 20 seconds. I would just add that with regard to the floodplain and disallowing the NFIP to participate, as Mr. Ellis said, with new resilient construction, we can continually talking about greater choice, greater choice. So leave the NFIP in as a choice. Well, again, that's a, the backdrop and the obligation of the taxpayer for people continuing to build in areas uh, that uh, are floodplain areas. Thank you very much. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Heck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sachs, I'd like to walk through a door that Congressman Cleaver unlocked if he didn't crack open a little bit. Uh, if I read the website of the National Wildlife Federation correctly, it would be that the organization subscribes to the scientific consensus that, in fact, planet Earth is experiencing climate change. It's having consequences and will continue to do so in an increasing amount. Is that fair characterization? Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, I also read this line on your website. Scientists have concluded that most of the observed warming is very likely due to the burning of coal, gas, oil. Other reasonable explanations, most notably changes in the sun, have been ruled out. So can I fairly infer, therefore, that the National Wildlife Federation believes that climate change is primarily caused by human activity. Is that fair? That's correct. Uh, I also read other language that led me to conclude that the organization believes that one of the consequences of climate change are increased extreme weather occurrences like drought and uh, fire danger and hurricanes hurricanes which result in flooding. Is that correct? That is correct. Mr. Sachs? Is it also true, by the way, that the organization is advocating that members of Congress voice their opposition to the President's withdrawal from the Paris Accords? That is correct. You see the connection between my line of questioning and our subject here today? I do, and, and I agree. I would also make the point, though, that primarily when I come to work every day and think about this program, I think of it as a land use program, first and foremost, before I think climate. Climate, of course, is an exacerbator and a driver here, but... And, and indeed, the, the primary cause of exacerbation. I have another line of questioning, if I may, uh, for any of the members of the committee. I'm not exactly sure who would be most appropriate. Uh, I was actually literally reading through Section 8 of the National Flood Insurance Program Integrity Improvement Act. It would be the biggest mouthful to name a proposed bill imaginable, which excludes certain types of property from NFIP coverage, but allows state insurance regulators to waive those exclusions if they find a market contraction. I'm going to leave aside for the moment whether or not that's good policy and focus on the conditions under which a state regulator can issue a waiver because, well, frankly to me they seemed needlessly complex. I would invite you to check on pages 29 and 30 the conditions under which a state regulator could indeed issue a waiver. Uh, I find them confusing. I find them basically duplicative. Uh, I find my characterization of them just now gross understatement in that regard. Uh, and frankly, to me, it seems like we should either say we trust the state regulators and their knowledge of conditions in the market that they know best. And after all, they are in most states elected or appointed, and it is the repository of deep expertise in this regard. And we defer to them about whether to exercise a waiver like this. Or, if we decide to be more prescriptive about what we want states to do, be forthright about that. 
Be upfront about that. Be clear about that. Be less confusing. This section seems like it's trying to have it both ways, giving state regulators waiver authority and then making them jump through a lot of confusing hoops to use it that serve, in my opinion, no useful purpose. So my question to any of the witnesses is, why all this complexity? Uh, why not just say, again, we trust the states, we trust the state regulators, and have a simpler, more straightforward waiver? Ms. Sternhill, I am calling upon you because you grabbed your microphone. Fair enough, sir. Uh, I would agree. I mean, and part of what gives us concern about this is the year-to-year -year nature of this. That I can be somebody who has new construction, we've been granted a waiver, I have NFIP, now there's hearings, I don't know if next year I have to have it or if I need to seek out um, a private policy now. And what this does, if somehow that coverage lapses because there's ambiguity in the system and I, now I no longer have maintained continuous coverage or there's an event when I'm sort of in that donut hole, and there's also the concern that, you know, some people may not be able to get private coverage. And so you may, there may be sufficient penetration elsewhere, um, but not where I'm located. Um, and based on how my state has defined it, I am now sort of in a donut hole of no coverage available to me. Thank you. Thank Time you. of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lehman. Um, in your testimony, you expressed support for Chairman Lutkemeyer's Taxpayer Exposure Mitigation Act, yep. which has been incorporated into our package. As you know, this bill would require FEMA to, re to use reinsurance and other risk transfer tools to reduce taxpayer exposure to catastrophic losses. Mm -hmm. You testified, quote, as FEMA gains more experience buying reinsurance and as reinsurers gain more experience absorbing risk from the NFIP, you anticipate that future risk transfers could be significantly larger. Yep. As you know, under our proposal, private insurers will begin to take a greater share of the flood insurance market as well. Can you describe the role that reinsurers will play in the flood insurance market as the private sector's share increases? Sure. I, I mean, I, I would say there was some discussion earlier about whether uh, insurance companies are clamoring for flood risk. In the reinsurance market, there's no question that they are. Uh, the reinsurance market has been a soft market for quite some time. Uh, there, is no, there is more capital than there is risk, uh, and they, they desperately want more risk to take on. So reinsurers are, are very eager. Uh, the first reinsurance transaction this year was oversubscribed. Uh, there were many companies that wanted to take part that weren't able to. Uh, so we, I think that reinsurers will, will be taking the lead in a lot of cases in providing capacity uh, and that the primary insurers will follow. Once there is available uh, reinsurance for private primary flood insurance, uh, more will, will enter the market on, on that side as well. Can you talk about how this would impact consumers? I, we think this it's unquestionably a good thing for consumers because the you would only be buying a private policy uh, if you uh, have a better deal, if you have a better product or you have a cheaper product. Um, for taxpayers as well, reinsurers participating in taking out risk from the from the NFIP means that we should have less examples of the sorts of borrowing that led us to a twenty five billion dollar debt. You also mentioned in your testimony about the UK uh, as an example of a place where a healthy private flood market has taken root. Can you talk a bit about how the UK and perhaps other countries have been able to foster a private uh, flood insurance market? So in, in the UK, flood insurance is included as a part of homeowners insurance. It's actually required. Um, that is not uh, an approach that we at our street wouldn't necessarily endorse in the United States, but that on a state-by-state -state basis, uh, states will determine whether uh, an all-risk policy is something they think is appropriate, and it's, it's been proposed many times in the past. Uh, we think that moving in, in the direction of more private flood insurance makes that a possibility, but it's, it's one among a, a menu of options. Uh, Mr. Ellis, uh, I want to uh, um, talk a little bit about some state issues here. Uh, uh, as you know, some have expressed concerns about consumer protections for homeowners who purchase insurance through surplus lines. My own state's insurance commissioner, Teresa Miller, testified before this committee in support of Representative Ross's bill last Congress and expressed a high level of comfort with not admitted carriers. Is there evidence to show that state insurance commissioners or state regulators have not protected consumers, particularly with policies sold through non-admitted carriers via surplus lines? 
Uh, not to my knowledge, Congressman, and this is sort of the natural way of, ev of evolution of an insurance product is to go through surplus lines until then to admitted carriers. Would you agree or disagree that insurance products sold to non-admitted carriers via surplus lines brings much needed insurance products and services to consumers? Absolutely, Congressman. Uh, Mr. Ellison, your testimony discussed the GAO's finding that large cross subsidies are built into the NFIP and that they are largely benefiting high income homeowners. I know Chairman Duffy talked a little bit about this earlier, but can you talk a bit about why the program's current structure creates this dynamic and how the committee committees may address this problem? Absolutely, Congressman. And actually, the the, uh, the exact figures are that from the Government Accountability Office is that 78 percent of subsidized properties in the NFIP are located in counties with the highest home values, so the top three deciles, while only 5 percent of subsidized properties are in counties with the lowest home values, the bottom five deciles. And so what, what has happened is, is that um, a lot of these are these uh, grandfathered properties, these pre-firm properties that are, that are staying here and that are getting these subsidies, whereas and there's some new development, they're paying the full freight and, and, and disproportionately subsidizing those uh, wealthier homeowners. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask for unanimous consent uh, to enter into the record some letters here. One is from the National Association. So these letters are expressing concern with the draft bills from various stakeholders, including housing insurance and consumer advocates and lenders. Without objection. Uh, one, just for the record, uh, one is from the National Association of Realtors. Uh, statement on behalf of the Council of Insurance Agents and Brokers, the Consumer Federation of America, and the Credit Union National Association, all concerned about provisions of the bill. Um, so Ms. Bernie and, and Ms. Sternhell, in reading this bill, it, it, there's, a, there's sort of a pattern that, that emerges, and that is that the burden and the cost shifting seems to go from the national level really to fall on the states and, and local government. Uh, mitigation, there's no, no money at all for mitigation. So. Any mitigation that's gonna be done in accordance with this bill will have to be done by uh, the city of New Orleans or the, the town of Situate, Massachusetts. Um, it'll fall on those, those localities actually to, to take those mitigation steps. Uh, as well as a voluntary buyout program, but there's no money, there's no money on the federal level for that. So I would imagine that uh, New York, after a Superstorm Sandy situation, or uh, New Orleans or Florida would have to come up with that. So, so it seems to be taking the burden off of the federal taxpayer and putting it on the, the locality. And as well, uh, on the commercial properties, uh, it, it introduces the, the opportunity for cherry picking, which would uh, again, shift costs uh, to a, a smaller group of people away from a larger group of people. And uh, I'm just wondering, the, the whole principle behind insurance is to really spread risk. And this bill seems to have the opposite effect. It actually concentrates the risk on a smaller number of people who are, uh, are more, more vulnerable. Um, and I, I just want to get uh, Ms. Sternhill, if I could get your opinion, and Ms. Bernie. Um, Am I wrong on this? Uh, respectfully, sir, we would we would agree with your um, with your assessment. We are support we're supportive of improvements to the program, but not in a way that destabilizes the NFIP. Um, with regard to mitigation, it has been a leading policy area that we have advocated for, uh, and we've included in our written testimony some potential ideas for increasing funding. Um, one additional idea could potentially be to freeze just the interest accrual on the debt for the duration of this authorization. That's about $400 million a year uh, to provide for greater funding for mitigation. Uh, that's would provide greater benefit um, rather than just moving money from one federal government pocket to another. Um, and then another uh, concept we'll mention is just increasing program participation. Again, it will reduce taxpayer exposure, reduce the risk of flood losses, and potentially bring in more revenues uh, from healthy premiums that are being paid into the NFIP. And so we think those should be some additional um, proposals the committee should consider ahead of reauthorization. Great, and, and the, the idea of uh, going for private insurance, that, that lowers the level of participation in the NFIP, right? 
Yes, yeah, so we would we support the private market coming in as long as it's done alongside a healthy and sustainable NFIP. Okay, Ms. Turnhill? Uh, I wholeheartedly concur with that. Um, that was why the, the approach the city has offered is one that can dispel fears or validate them right. about what the private market would do to the NFIP and its ability to, to pool risk appropriately. One other provision that I notice in this bill is that uh, ostensibly it lowers the maximum uh, mandatory rate from 18 to 15 percent, but on the other end it, it increases what is now probably around a 5 percent average rate of contribution and bumps that up to, to 8 percent. When you look at FEMA's numbers, no one's paying 18 percent. Correct. No one's paying 18 percent. So that's, that's kind of fake. So, so no one really benefits from that. But a whole lot of people who are paying between 5 and 6 percent are going to be bumped up to 8 percent. And that's the real impact of the bill. Is that how you see this? Yes, and we would even argue that it's 9% with the additional charge on the right. reserve assessment. Right, surcharge. That's well. right. That's mm -hmm. right. I forgot about that. Yeah, good point. I agree. Okay. I think my time has just about expired, so I yield back. Thank you for your testimony. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. MacArthur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my home is in New Jersey, and uh, so we know all about flood and, uh, and flood insurance. I had to smile earlier, there was talk about the mapping, and we built a home some years ago, and I got the flood map. My living room was in one flood zone, and my bedroom was in a different flood zone. It's not that big a house, but uh, that's the way the mapping was. But my questions are on other subjects. We are one of the states with the highest participation in the flood program, and we also were hurt the most by Sandy. Half of all New Jersey flood losses occurred, Sandy losses occurred in my district. So this is very important to me. And I wanted to ask, do you, do any of you know how many Americans live in coastal communities, coastal counties, I mean coastal county, counties that abut the ocean? Anybody? It's about half, I believe. It's about 140 million people. Yeah. How does it, affect beyond the homeowner who's had a flood loss, who else is affected by flooded communities? In general, I'll, I'll take an answer, brief answer from anybody. I, I mean, you can look at a state economy. If you've got sort of the Jersey Shore where you have the boardwalk and then sort of a, a tourism economy, you have sort of social networks. Um, apart from a homeowner trying to rebuild, kids being able to go to school. Uh, you have a whole, whole, I mean, infrastructure more broadly to, yeah, to rebuild. So, so, so other, other businesses, uh, state and local taxes get affected, federal taxes get affected by business decline, and that's exactly what I've seen uh, back at home. I want to be clear, I absolutely support the reforms in the bill because the reality is the program won't be sustained if we don't fix it. We can't just keep running in arrears, we have to fix this. But I want to make the point that this is much bigger than the individual policyholder. And in fact, if we have less policyholders, those are the very people and businesses that will be at the front of the line to get FEMA grants and will be spending federal dollars without having gotten the benefit of federal or of, of individual premiums paid in for that. So, so we have to get this right. I have questions in just a couple of areas. Uh, the first is new construction, this uh, elimination after four years. And I, I do support lifting up a private market. I spent my whole career in insurance, and there, there should be a more robust flood market out there. Uh, I want to ask, though, the 10% the threshold, that if there is 10% market penetration by an insured, and I think, Mr. Ellis, I'll start with you on this. Is it possible that you could have 10%, even 50%, even a higher market penetration, could you have that but have an individual not be able to find flood insurance on their particular risk? And, and bear in mind, these are homes that probably are older if they're being torn down, and now they would be subject to more rigorous zoning restraints. They'd be more flood-proof properties. <clears throat> Excuse me. But is it possible an individual could find no access to insurance in an otherwise robust private market? 
I, I'm assuming it could be possible, although for the exact reasons that you outlined, Congressman, about the, the, the zoning and the new development, and then also the fact that the developer is going to want to sell that home to somebody, and part of that getting that home is going to have uh, flood insurance. Is it, is it possible, and, and I spent 30 years in insurance, and I, I spent some of those years in the flood market, but it's been a, a while since I've rolled around in that industry. Do any of you think it would be reasonable to require agents because they are agents of the flood program, require them to either provide an alternate private market quote or certify that none is available. Would that be a, a, a practical requirement of agents? I, I, I don't know that you could get agents to, you have a certain number of appointments and there could be a conflict there uh, regarding are you representing your company or are you representing NFIP? In I'm, I'm, uh, I'm running out of time, so I have one more question. It's for Ms. Bernie. You said in your opening remarks that the 8% floor hurts more than the 6% ceiling. We do have to get people toward risk-based rates. We have to for this program to be sustained. What would you suggest would be an appropriate floor for premium increases? Well, the Bigger Waters Act um, require that subsidized properties go to full risk rates, and um, the 2014 law maintained that. And so we, we feel that the 5% the floor is sufficient, uh, especially when considering um, last year print FEMA increased premiums 5.4% on the base rate, but 6.3% when including fees. So we would- My time has expired. Thank time. you. I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Custoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the witnesses for being here this morning and now this afternoon to, to testify. If I could, regarding the flood mapping, and Mr. Ellis, if I could address this to you, we've heard today that reforms are, are desperately needed to the NFIB, and to me, there's probably no more statistic that's any more glaring than the fact that the program is almost $25 billion in debt. But as we look at the flood mapping reforms, if I could share an example with you that recently I met with a constituent of mine who owns a house that was built in the 1970s. A home is not located near a major river, it's not located near a, a tributary, and FEMA has never required the individual, the owner, to purchase flood insurance. Even during the 100-year flood of the Mississippi River in 2011, the home did not sustain any flood damage. However, two years ago in 2015, FEMA determined that a portion, not the whole house, but a portion was located in the flood zone and that the owner was mandated to purchase flood insurance. My question to you is, is how after 45 years of owning a home is it suddenly designated as being located within a flood zone without having any history of flooding? Well, Congressman, and, and uh, I don't know, obviously don't know the exact circumstances of this situation. I mean, you outlined them, but certainly because of other development patterns, because of other uh, changes, a, a home could move from being not in the flood zone to actually being in the flood zone. Could have been just outside of it or whatever. I, I don't know the exact circumstances here, but it does get back to, again, that it is in in the, in the public, the homeowner's interest, you know, to have a better mapping program, to have more confidence in the mapping program, because if you don't have confidence, then we're just gonna continue to have these fights about I'm in the floodplain or not in the floodplain. And if you're just barely, it, barely outside of the floodplain, you still got a significant amount of flood risk, Congressman. I mean, certainly the people in Baton Rouge found that out, that they may not have been required to purchase flood insurance, but they sure wish they had. If, if a property owner wants to dispute the decision by FEMA, can you describe the, the process for doing so? What normally is is that they have to get a, uh, uh, particularly if it's a grandfathered property, which I'm assuming if this house was built in the 70s, probably was before the flood insurance rate map was done, that um, they have to get an elevation certificate, which can be several hundred dollars, um, which, you know, depending on who the person is, could be a, a huge cost. And that's why we've really pushed to follow like, uh, things like North Carolina has done, where the state took the, their mapping money or took the mapping money and did uh, LIDAR um, for all the higher risk areas and actually provided that information to the public and think that's a the more responsible way. And that's why we're pushing for FEMA to have more granular data in this reauthorization. Thank you very much. Mr. Lehman, if I, if I could, uh, my district or part of my district runs along the Mississippi River. 
Yep. And I'm interested in how we calculate premiums for inland properties as opposed to coastal properties, and specifically properties that are protected by levees and dams. Can you explain how FEMA differentiates between inland and coastal properties when assessing that risk? Uh, this is not my area of expertise. I wouldn't. Uh, I couldn't tell you that. Okay. Does any do any of the witnesses know, Mr. Ellis? Well, they have certain higher designations. Like, for instance, if you're risk of storm surge and things along those lines, you have the V zone, which is going to have a higher um, um, premium than you would have in a coastal area. Also, um, NFIP, if you if you're behind a levee and the levee provides a hundred year level of protection or more, you're considered not to be in the special flood hazard area anymore. I would argue you still have a residual risk. It probably is still in your interest to purchase flood insurance. It would be cheaper because of that level of protection, but they are supposed to take that into account. And if, if looking at those rates and the NFIB program for, for authorization, the draft, do you believe that the premium rates will be lower for inland property owners? Uh, generally, depending on, you know, whether they are, uh, you know, there's certainly been significant flooding on the Mississippi River. Uh, I first got into this whole uh, area when I was in the Coast Guard and Base St. Louis flooded in 1993, uh, and I was out there for that. So, I mean, there would be some risk, but it would be less than some for the higher risk coastal areas like Florida. When you look at when the, when the uh, considerations being done for, for premiums, should the inland properties located within the flood protection structures like levees or dams, should they be assessed differently? Well, my understanding is that they are currently, Congressman. They take into account the level of, uh, of um, protection. And again, though, my concern would be that there is some residual risk. I mean, we certainly have seen levees fail in, in, in areas, and that's something where those people would be flooded just like they were in the regular floodplain. Thank you. I yield back my time. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Tinney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just have a couple of issues. I come from upstate New York, which uh, we don't really have any... Uh, what you would think major flooding, but we've had major flooding. Um, a lot of it I'd like to uh, place on the fault of government. Uh, in some cases, I would, I would like to specifically just quickly mention something, as I think it's something that we can address on the federal level, having to do with the Department of Environmental Conservation in New York State. And uh, unfortunately, what's happened is a lot of the intervention from the state and federal side of it has prevented our local governments from being able to protect themselves from from really just heavy rains, not necessarily what we have termed 100-year floods. And I just want to point out one thing uh, that is particularly difficult for uh, an area like uh, where I live, which is um, a small city, uh, suburban area. And Article 15 of the Department of Our Environmental Conservation Regulations talks about protections of waterways and streams. And it names as its three goals relating to water policy is the establishment of regulations compatible with protections and enhancement of the present potential values of the water resources to protect the public health and welfare and that are consistent with the reasonable economic and social development of the state, including protecting the human environment. Um, this article has been interpreted to protect, unfortunately, the, uh, sea, sea going, or the, uh, the fish environment, I might add, uh, <laughs> without, with, for lack of a better term in the middle of a human environment where an area that was once industrialized, uh, we're seeing um, an inability of the local governments to be able to even participate in managing the streams and waterways because we are creating, let's put it this way, artificial uh, trout spawning uh, areas in the middle of former industrial areas where you know, basically the trout don't make it too far down the, down the stream. Um, but toward that, um, it has caused an imbalance in our water table and caused a lot of flooding in areas that have not received flooding in many, many years, just uh, high incidence of, of rain has caused us to have massive flooding and massive requests for, for aid from the federal government. Um, and this brings me to two big issues that I wanted to have possibly Ms. Bernie address since you're in that area. One is on the ability of the local governments to be able to map what true flood zones are and the ability to participate and get assistance from FEMA in areas where uh, these, we can't correct these areas immediately dealing with the Department of Environmental Conservation, but allowing FEMA to be able to come in and say, the local governments can determine where flood zones are to drive down the cost of flood insurance, to have the availability of flood insurance through NFIP, and with the fiscal idea in mind of eventually bringing NFIP's uh, fiscal uh, 
shift to the taxpayers back in line. So I'd say maybe, Ms. Bernie, you could address this issue as to your experience in, in an area which is truly in a flood zone. Yes, absolutely. So. Um, in South Louisiana, since Katrina, we've worked at several local governments have taxed themselves uh, in order to generate more money to build local flood protection features. And we have had to work very closely with FEMA through the development of new maps to get those locally built flood protections, levees, drainage improvements included onto the map. Um, we had a lot of um, trouble when the first iteration of maps were redone for several parishes because it didn't take those uh, locally built flood protection features into account. We, several communities in Louisiana are now part of a pilot program um, called the Levy Analysis Mapping Procedure LAMP process, which is deter which is which was established to um, essentially help give credit for some of these local flood protection features. And so um, we're working very closely, and, and it's certainly been our experience that uh, local governments and local levy districts and local floodplain managers have um, the most data and really need to be involved through the mapping process as well. And so um, I, I believe the Technical Mapping Advisory Council is getting more engaged towards this as well. But um, local governments, when they're able to provide maps, deliver and ultimately a better product working with FEMA. Right. So this is something that you think is feasible that we could do, provide in New York, because really, we technically really aren't in a flood zone, but we've created such a disastrous scenario in our in our very rural inland uh, region of the state that we actually do have problems. We have had massive flooding. Um, I'd love to see us uh, roll back the cost, obviously make an, you know the national flood insurance program more affordable, mm -hmm. reduce the burden on the taxpayers and taking the risk on this. But I, I appreciate your comments and I uh, just wanted to, I think I'm, I'm losing my time here, but I want to say thank you that I hope that we can find a resolution here that would give our local governments the opportunity to protect themselves um, since our, our state government doesn't seem to be interested in allowing them to protect themselves and our taxpayers and the value of our properties. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. I yield back my time. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciated all of the great testimony. I wanted to put a bit of a face on the flood insurance program and flooding. Uh, as he said, I represent Indiana, and in a small rural community, we had a flood a couple of weeks ago, but the story starts far before that. Brooklyn Bush started her American dream on June 1st of 2015. She opened a small hair salon. Her mom had owned a hair salon before that. She opened it on Water Street, which by the way, isn't in a 100-year floodplain. And then on May 19th of this year, because of 30 minutes of really, really hard rain, where more than six inches fell during that 30 minutes and in the previous few hours before that, her entire hair salon was flooded. Not flooded by six inches, not flooded by 12 inches, but flooded five feet deep in her hair salon. And so her American dream ended that day, and she is struggling to get back on her feet. Now, somewhat lost in the conversation about how we help individuals get flood insurance that are in 100-year floodplains are those that we need to ensure that have access to it. Because one of the things that she talked about was, I would have bought flood insurance, but no one talked to me about flood insurance. I'm outside the 100-year floodplain. And I think one of the things we need in terms of a private market participation is more people understanding and pushing this product and helping people understand their risks. And I think, Mr. Lehman, you talked about this earlier with the high percentage of people Inside, outside of the 100-year floodplain or how percentage of population that purchases inside the 100-year floodplain, but not outside of it. While there's still risk there, can you talk a little bit about how we might expand the program because of the access to private capital and the access to private insurers? Sure. I mean, well, I would li I'd like to expand who buys, yeah. expand take up, right? right? Whether it is in the NFIP or, or in private insurance, we prefer that more risk be shifted to private insurance. Yes. Uh, if there are private products that agents can make some money selling, they will definitely do their best to market it to a broad range of, of people. Um, historically, it has basically been tied to your, to your mortgage. If you, right. were, you were required to get it, that's, that's who got it. Right. That's who were, were ever told about it. There have been efforts, Flood Smart is, is a pretty good effort, to try to spread the word beyond that, con that cohort. It's, it's not terribly successful, and I, I couldn't tell you if the ROI was worth it for the government 
to spend that money, but it is yeah. it is a public good. That well, ultimately, I think what you said, I really latch on to, right, is that if we align the incentives for individual sellers of this product to sell private products to individuals, then those individuals be more likely to purchase and we'll see uptake, not only in the 100-year areas, but also in other areas. And I totally believe what you're saying. I think Mr. Ellis talked about this a few minutes ago with, in Baton Rouge, I believe you brought up the example of people that would have liked to have purchased it, right, but might be outside the 100-year flood plan. Absolutely, Congressman. As a matter of fact, I have the number right here, the, the, um, after the Baton Rouge flooding, the average NFIP payment um, was $86,500. If you didn't have flood insurance, the average individual disaster aid payment was $9,150. Mm -hmm. And so really, you want to have more people getting flood insurance, and I sympathize with Ms. Bush, your constituent, yeah. and that, you know, what we are hoping is, is that you develop a greater private flood insurance market. The insurance agents, the people that sold her her other right. business insurance, are going to understand this better, are going to say, hey, here's this other product. You're not in the highest risk area, you're not in the 100-year floodplain, so it shouldn't be that much more expensive. But if you do have a disaster, which they do happen, then you're going to be covered. Right. And I think that stems from getting more and more private players into the market, more and more opportunities. The other thing Absolutely. That, the other thing that came up in this was how vanilla the current product is and how we need more private players in the market so that we can develop different policies that cover different types of people. And one example was also some apartments at dwellings were flooded, right? And the contents inside, while the structure may have been covered, the contents inside wasn't. Um, and we've got to make sure that we develop those policies. And I think that comes through more private players, right? Able to develop different types of products that ultimately people will or won't buy and those that they will buy are successful over the long run. Any comment on that, Mr. Ringley? Yes, yeah, certainly in, in the, on the commercial side, uh, NFIP doesn't provide uh, much in the way of business interruption insurance. On, right. the, on, the, pri on the personal residential side, uh, if, you want to, if you need to stay in a home, I mean, stay in a hotel while your home is being worked on, there isn't coverage for that. So these are the sorts of things, product features that you would expect in the private market. Right, in a private market where people begin to decide what they want and what they don't want, and companies are incentivized to offer more and more products, right? Just like we see in other insurance products, companies develop gap measures to be able to account for what people need. The last question I wanted to ask of Mr. Saxon, Mr. Heck had brought up some of the maybe increasing challenges associated with climate change and other reasons why the risk may be increasing for flooding around the country. I guess what I think about is if the risk goes up but we fail to make any changes to the pricing on the policies, wouldn't we expect the program itself to be less and less actuarially sound over time? I think that's correct. I would add one point to, to what you were saying before, which is we encourage that FEMA map beyond the 100-year floodplain. Right. Not necessarily require purchase, but um, Ms. Bush should have known she had flood risk. Right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I yield back. Time is gentlemen has expired. I will, for what purpose, gentlemen from Massachusetts seek recognition, unanimous consent requests? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a letter from uh, Mitch Landrew, mayor of the city of New Orleans, citing concerns regarding the lack of affordability. Uh, without, without objection. And, uh, flood mapping process and uh, uh, lack of mitigation. Without, without, without objection. Thank you. There being no other members in the queue, I want to thank each of our witnesses for coming to testify today. We are most appreciative. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. And I would ask for the witnesses to respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing stands adjourned. <laughs>